Welcome back to the Academic Agent Retrospective. This is part 11, almost on the final uh, final straight now. There are three more left after this. Um, this one is about critiquing libertarianism. While I spent much of 2019 and 2020 outlining elite theory and dismantling boomer truth, as you've seen from the previous uh, you know, parts of the retrospective, I had not yet explicitly made a public and decisive break with libertarianism. This was the series that changed all that and stuck the final knife into Snack. People are going to tread on you, Snack. <laughs> uh, all right, just before we get going, um, I will remind you, again, that um, there's a tie-in promotion with this retrospective series. Use the code RETRO to get £100 off any bundle on the academic agency. Get them while they're still there. Uh, otherwise, uh, enjoy the show. Strap in. It's going to be a fairly long one, I think. Uh, I know at least one part of this series is over an hour long. So this could be one of the, the longer episodes but it is an absolutely thorough dismantling of libertarianism. I'll see you in the live chat in the comments. Since I have been thinking a lot about logic recently, I thought it might be interesting to try to get to the core of why libertarian arguments have failed to make much headway against socialism over the past century or so. And to do this, I have attempted to boil down into logically valid syllogisms the core arguments that libertarians tend to make. So here is the core utilitarian argument advanced by Ludwig von Mises and also by Chicago school economists such as Milton Friedman. They might disagree on method and how they get to this conclusion, but ultimately the argument is the same. If increasing material prosperity is our aim, then the free market is the best method of achieving it. Material prosperity is our aim, therefore we should pursue free markets. Now, reflexively, some socialists might brittle at the minor premise here. Material prosperity is our aim, and we will return to this soon. Now, libertarians of the Rothbardian stripe make a different argument, relying not on utility, but on morality. It's something like this. If maximizing freedom is our aim, then the free market is the best method of achieving it. Maximizing freedom is our aim, therefore we should pursue free markets. And here again, reflexively, some socialists might wish to take issue with the minor premise. Is maximizing freedom our aim as a society? But again, let's return to that in a bit. Now a typical socialist argument might look like this. If equality for all is our aim, then socialism is the best method of achieving it. Equality is our aim, therefore we should pursue socialism. And of course here, many libertarians would take immediate issue with the minor premise. However, if you read Milton Friedman, for example, in his famous 1946 essay on rent controls, with George Stigler, which is called Roofs or Ceilings, he just grants socialists this premise. And then he argues along these lines. He says, socialism always increases inequality. Inequality is bad. Therefore, socialism is bad. I don't believe it is wise to grant socialists the premise that equality is our ultimate goal or even that inequality is bad. So this is a weak counter in my view. The moral ground has already been seeded by Friedman here. Now Mises has a cleverer answer to this, which is to say, materialism is concerned with prosperity. Socialist claims about equality are materialist. Therefore, socialist claims about equality are about prosperity. In Human Action, Mises points out that socialism ultimately promises to make everyone better off and that its foundations rest on materialist assumptions. This is absolutely true 
and Marxism is explicitly a materialist mode of thinking, whether dialectical materialism or historical materialism. Socialist thought nearly always casts itself as a rationalist scientific doctrine. This means that intelligent socialists cannot disagree with the premise that material prosperity is our aim. Another counter is something like this, which is advanced by Murray Rothbard in his essay, Egalitarianism as a Revolt Against Human Nature. Boiled down, it would be along these lines. That which is against human nature is morally wrong. Equality is against human nature. Therefore, equality is morally wrong. The typical socialist response to this would be to call Rothbard an essentialist. The argument states, social constructs can change. Human nature is a social construct. Therefore, human nature can change. Socialists ultimately believe that people can be conditioned into becoming the new socialist man and that such things as self-interest and greed are taught behaviours, the result of capitalist structures. Of course, here, the minor premise that human nature is a social construct is highly questionable and socialists are on much weaker ground here. However, they do not need to go this route. They might cite David Hume or G. E. Moore and simply accuse Rothbard of making the naturalistic fallacy. The argument would be something like this. No, what is claims can be moral. All claims about human nature are what is claims. Therefore, no claims about human nature can be moral. Faced with this, one has some choices. If religious, one might invoke God and perhaps get into theology. That which God creates is good. That which is natural was created by God. Therefore, that which is natural is good. Here, most socialists would simply assert their atheism and leave it at that. Others might wish to pursue atheist arguments against the concept of God. But either way, this would be an impasse. Another option is to take the argument into ethics, for example, invoke Aristotle's virtue ethics and suggest that equality cannot be a true moral aim because it is not eudaimonistic, something like this. Eudaimonia is not equality. The goal of human life is eudaimonia. Therefore, equality is not the goal of human life. Or you can simply accept Hume's law and state no materialist claims can be moral, all socialist claims are materialist, therefore no socialist claims are moral. To which a clever socialist might respond no materialist claims can be moral, all libertarian claims are materialist, therefore no libertarian claims are moral. Now, Mises and Friedman would both have accepted this because they did not see themselves making moral arguments at all. They were making value-free utilitarian arguments. But Rothbard would likely fire back by stating that maximizing freedom is not a materialist goal, unlike equality. All our claims seek to maximize freedom. Therefore, none of our claims are materialist. Now, again, the knee-jerk socialist might fire back just to try to own the libertarian here with the highest good is not freedom, the goal of human activity is the highest good, therefore the goal of human activity is not freedom. However, the well-read socialist would actually accept Rothbard's premise, remembering what Marx's utopia is ultimately about. Communism results in ultimate freedom. Socialism aims at achieving communism. Therefore, socialism maximizes freedom. So if we think carefully about all of the arguments I've presented here, an issue has emerged. Using arguably the three most prominent libertarian thinkers of the 20th century, the first, Milton Friedman, accepts the socialist premise that equality is the aim of society. The second, 
Ludwig von Mises, accepts the socialist premise that material prosperity is the aim of society. And the third, Murray Rothbard, accepts the socialist premise that total freedom is the aim of society. What does this tell us? Ultimately, the disagreement between libertarians and socialists is a disagreement over means and not ends. This means that libertarians and socialists, in the final analysis, share the same goals. The method might differ very greatly, enough to make them mortal enemies, but the final destination is the same. Now, while libertarians are basically correct in this fight, at least on almost all of the technical and practical disagreements, it strikes me that one of the chief reasons that they never defeat the socialists is because deep down they share the same metaphysical and possibly even moral assumptions. I do not believe socialism can be defeated within either the materialist framework or one that accepts the central assumption of the French Revolution as Rothbard and other Jeffersonian libertarians appear to. The challenge, it seems to me, must come from a deeper place. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years, from the time of Aristotle through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out. A couple of weeks ago, I made a video called Issues with Libertarian Arguments Against Socialism. And predictably, I got a little bit of pushback from libertarians who objected to my critique, saying that I equivocated on my definition of freedom, and therefore uh, the argument falls apart. Now, equivocation means that you're using the same word to mean two different things. On the face of it, equivocation is an informal fallacy, a fallacy of language. But in fact, it becomes a formal fallacy, um, something called the four-term fallacy, uh, when you write it out uh, using symbols. Uh, M is P, S is N, therefore S is P, the four-term fallacy. Now, I understand the importance of definitions. In fact, uh, I wrote a book last year which starts with passage on the importance of definitions and I take pains, great pains, uh, to uh, focus on the differing meanings of freedom. This comes back to Isaiah Berlin's two concepts of liberty, of course, positive liberty, the freedom to, and negative liberty, the freedom from. And in that book I lean very heavily, as does the entire liberal and libertarian tradition, on freedom from, negative liberty, uh, rejecting the Rousseauian notion of uh, positive liberty or the freedom to. However, since then I have reflected on uh, whether these two types of liberty are really as different as they appear. And I came across this essay by Gerald C. McCullum Jr. Um, written in 1967 in the Philosophical Review, in which he argues that the distinction made by Isaiah Berlin is false. He argued that there is only really one concept of freedom, and it is as follows. Freedom has three terms. One, an agent. Two, certain preventing conditions. And three, certain doings or becomings of the agent. McCullum's argument is something like this when written out formally. No free agents are constrained by certain 
preventing conditions. All who can do or become certain things are free agents. Therefore, none who can do or become certain things are constrained by certain preventing conditions. Now, if you really think about this, the distinction between freedom to and freedom from therefore uh, falls down. The preventing conditions, once they're taken away, give you a freedom to do something. So the typical libertarian slash liberal distinction between these two things, uh, according to McCullum, is built on a false dichotomy. Now, I thought it might be interesting to test this uh, case by writing out the syllogism again, but swapping the terms with uh, a real life example like trans women. And it would go something like this. No transitioned trans women are constrained by laws preventing sex changes. All who could transition and did transition are transitioned trans women. Therefore, none who could transition and did transition are constrained by laws preventing sex changes. Now, of course, in this case, note that the trans woman was both free from laws preventing transition and free to transition. So both negative and positive liberty was fulfilled. And in this way, McCullum shows that the distinction is ultimately a false one. Ah, but you might be thinking, what about the fact that trans activists want to force you to use their pronouns? Well, people who wish to misgender trans women are constrained by gender pronoun laws. And again, using McCullum's terms, they are not free from laws preventing you from misgendering trans women and therefore you are not free to misgender trans women. So the law that allows sex changes is a liberal law. But the law that prevents misgendering is an illiberal law by this definition. So what happened here? Well, in this case, in the case of uh, transgenderism as an issue, liberalism or libertarianism acted as the handmaiden to socialism. It created the conditions in which it was possible for the illiberal law to be made. And this is a reoccurring pattern throughout recent history. For example, ending the Jim Crow laws in America was a liberal law. But the second step, the state mandated desegregation, was an illiberal or socialist law, literally compelling at gunpoint people to go to school together who didn't necessarily want to go to school together. Note that conservative illiberal laws on social issues, such as a law preventing sex changes or uh, a, a racial segregation law like Jim Crow, are nearly always overturned. And this is celebrated by liberals or libertarians. Whereas socialist liberal laws on social issues are never overturned and liberals or libertarians seldom fight them for long. Thus, what we see is liberals and libertarians working first to make conservative losses permanent and secondly to make socialist gains permanent because of this dynamic that we have seen recur over and over again. And this is consistent with my original argument. Libertarians and socialists ultimately share the same goals. And I have just uh, depicted this as a meme. You get the socialist and the libertarian, both handmaidens to each other. It turns out they, the libertarian ser serves to soften and repeal an existing conservative law. The socialist then goes a step further and mandates compliance, as in the case of the transgender or in the case of the desegregation laws. Now, in fact, what we're seeing are 
I think, the twin heads of international finance. Uh, first, when they want to relax a law for themselves or their overwhelmingly hedonistic vision of society, they call on their libertarian friends for support. And then secondly, when they want to impose a law, typically to banish traditional morality, they can call on their socialist friends for support. And there's a logic to this because guess what? Sin sells. The seven deadly sins, lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride are all relentlessly uh, pushed by the uh, services that uh, liberal laws allow to proliferate. Sin is a very useful tool of control. And I will show you some uh, test cases here. The perfect minion of those in power is someone who is addicted to porn or cheap sexuality, lust, somebody who loves to consume food, gluttony, someone who can be easily bribed by money, greed, someone who is lazy, sloth, someone who is easily outraged, wrath, someone who is jealous of what others have, envy of course, and someone who has an unearned or excessive sense of self-worth. And that is of course the original sin of pride. Now, I understand that not everybody is a Christian. I am not a Christian, but I don't think the seven deadly sins are unique simply to Christianity. I think that they are something approaching the natural uh, laws of mankind. Everybody understands uh, that it's not good to be gluttonous, to be greedy, to be lazy, um, excessive lust or cheap lust, uh, jealousy, pride. I mean, these are uh, almost undoubtedly bad things that proliferate when liberals successfully overturn conservative uh, laws and then they, the socialists go a step further and then they serve to mandate acquiescence to these things or in some cases even make it illegal to uh, point them out and we've, there are just too many examples to note through history. Now libertarians here will object and they will say well that's not me it's all a matter of self-control we know sin is wrong but you need to be free to choose these are all the typical comebacks that the libertarian will um, come up with socialists meanwhile will answer I don't care about any of that they think nothing at all about imposing their will on the world and thirdly they consistently benefit from the slutty gluttonous, lazy, easily outraged, envious, and excessively vainglorious people who are produced by an anything goes set of social laws, which is brought about by a laissez-faire attitude in the social and the moral uh, sphere. It seems to me that these things go hand in hand with liberalism. Where there is an increase in liberalism, you see an increase in uh, these sorts of uh, behaviors which then gives rise to more socialism yes you get an increase in material wealth with liberalism but the negative side of that or the, the downside of that is that it comes with a massive increase in degeneracy everybody is just free to choose their own particular moral code everybody is just free to choose uh, whatever you want I mean, anything goes so of course you're going to end up with uh, more and more people thinking it's okay to uh, routinely commit acts that would have been unthinkable just a few generations ago. And paradoxically, given that the libertarian aim is ostensibly against those who hold power, their policy proposals benefit exactly those people who are in power. First, because socialists are exceptionally easily manipulated and therefore easy to control. Uh, anybody who doubts that just needs to look at the past uh, couple of years in US politics uh, or indeed in British politics to see uh, just how easily manipulated the left are. Um, because why? They, their whole system is 
built around respecting experts and authorities and essentially just parroting what they've been told in the Guardian. Meanwhile, libertarianism provides the perfect false flag in effectual opposition to socialism. Ineffectual for all of the reasons I've pointed out, and ineffectual because its understanding of freedom and the socialist understanding of freedom are in fact the same. And as I pointed out in the previous video, ultimately their ends are the same. These are both products of the French Revolution, um, just driving at different speed limits, so to speak. And what this kind of double handmaiden, mutually self-reinforcing situation uh, does for those in power is that it keeps the true enemy, uh, that is the true enemy of those in power, defeated in all cases. That's why you're currently watching the Republicans in America try to revert from Trumpism back to this kind of beltway libertarian Mitt Romney, small government, cuck GOP, um, because they know libertarianism doesn't really offer any genuine opposition to the things they want to do on the social front. And it's on the social and the cultural front that the left wins its most enduring victories. Then in the area where it counts for those in power, the libertarians put up a very good uh, resistance against any genuine socialism coming in. So, you know, in this country, the, the Jeremy Corbyn's and in America, the Bernie Sanders, they're never really going to get their way when it comes to having a more uh, command and control economy um, dictated from Whitehall or from Washington, because that would compromise the private and the, I would say, excessive private power of the likes of, you know, William Fence, Mark Zuckerberg, Apple, Google, the owners of newspapers, etc., etc. Because these private means are the vehicle through which those in power get to exercise their power without any real responsibility or accountability to anybody. So in fact, what libertarianism has done over the past 20, 30, 40 years is smooth the path of all of these people to make them less accountable, to make it easier for them to uh, dominate, while of course failing to overturn a single socialist or uh, leftist social policy that has been brought in after they paved the path by relaxing the original conservative law. So that's my uh, comeback on all of the criticisms I got from the first video. There is going to be a third video uh, in this trilogy where I uh, explore further some of the implications of what I'm uh, saying. Today I talked about the definition of freedom. In the next video I want to focus more on the consequences of a materialist mindset and how ultimately uh, libertarianism uh, plays into that materialist mindset uh, rather than resists it. Please note however that this has n absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with Austrian economics and its correctness. That's a quite separate issue from uh, what I'm saying here, which is ultimately about what a society and what people in that society value and hold dear. Uh, th these are questions of morals. And ultimately, as I'll explore next time, morals may be downstream of what people call metaphysics, or specifically epistemology, which is the metaphysics of knowledge. But that's for next time. See you then. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years, from the time of Aristotle through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support.
Now get out. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years, from the time of Aristotle through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. This is the third and final part of my trilogy of videos critiquing libertarianism and in which I seek to explain its abject failure against socialism for at least the past 100 years. I'm afraid by necessity this one will be much longer than the others. Before continuing, I think it is worth recapping my arguments thus far. In the first video, I argued that the core reason that libertarianism fails against socialism is because it shares the same goals. It accepts the socialist premise variously, by which I mean depending on the flavour of libertarianism, that society aims at maximising equality, that it aims at material prosperity, or that it aims at freedom. This is because they share a common root in Enlightenment values. In the second video, first I responded to criticisms that libertarians and socialists define freedom differently by collapsing the famous distinction between positive and negative liberty made by Isaiah Berlin through the slightly less famous argument of Gerald C. McCallum Jr. Then I went a step further and argued that libertarianism has acted as a handmaiden to socialism by helping to repeal old conservative laws which help to maintain tradition which is actually in the spirit of liberalism, which then paves the way for socialists to impose new illiberal leftist laws that mandate and compel a new status quo, essentially by banning the old conservative value. I argued that the net effect of this is that libertarians serve to bring about conditions in which there is an increase in degeneracy which produces more socialists who then lock in, so to speak, by law, the new status quo. Formally, I might write that argument as follows. Degeneracy creates socialists. Libertarianism creates degeneracy. Therefore, libertarianism creates socialists. I then went on to argue that although in theory, both libertarians and socialists have as their stated goal the total destruction of the nation state as we know it, in practice they have served as handmaidens to each other, essentially the useful idiots of those in power, by which I mean the oligarchs of international finance. Note, for the purposes of these videos, the terms liberalism and libertarianism are interchangeable. I use libertarianism chiefly for the benefit of American viewers. My critique includes the entire spectrum of libertarian thinkers, from Hayekians who accept a limited welfare state, minarchists who wish for a night watchman state, and anarcho-capitalists in the Rothbardian tradition. This may seem harsh, but just as Communists failed to have their revolution in the USA, but did succeed in trashing just about every social norm people held dear 70 years ago. Libertarians failed to abolish the Fed, but did succeed in legalizing weed, deregulating the movie industry and pornography, and helping to make said oligarchs less accountable to the people over whom they rule. However, in response to many comments, I must put aside Hans Hermann Hopper for one moment. Hopper is a very peculiar thinker who stands apart from the broad currents of libertarian thinking, and I must deal with his specific arguments in a separate video. I will also return to him later on in this one. For now, I will say, however, that I don't believe that Hopperland is going to happen anytime soon, but that is beside the point. With this preamble over, I want to go a step further again. In the first video, I discussed general social aims and first premises. 
In the second, I focused on the moral effects and practical consequences of libertarianism's continued failed opposition to socialism. In this video, I want to think about libertarianism, whether in its highest and strongest and most consistent form, which I'd say is in the tradition of Ludwig von Mises, or in its inferior empirical or positivist form embodied in someone like Milton Friedman, as being blinded to many important aspects of life by Enlightenment rationalism, which has buried in it what I will call, for the purposes of ease of understanding, a hidden egalitarianism. The basic unit of analysis in libertarian thinking is the individual. Now, long-time viewers of this channel will know that I have stressed constantly that individualism does not mean John Wayne going it alone against all odds. It means methodological individualism, which is simply the recognition that only the individual, as opposed to groups, can act, and therefore it must be our smallest unit of analysis. However, there is in this method a kind of flattening of human life. In the crudest cases, such as Jerry Bentham or John Stuart Mill, the individual becomes a util for whom happiness must be maximized. In the positivist economics of the Chicago School, the util becomes the rational, self-interested agent of game theory, in which people follow material incentives. In the Chicago School, of course, thinkers are much more careful, but there is still, even in the work of a genius like Mises, the concept of satisfactions. As I have stressed many times, a uh, quote-unquote satisfaction can be material or non-material, but it is captured as data by revealed preference, which is to say, after the fact of action itself. However, while this Austrian conception is much more nuanced than those of the other schools, it still has the effect of flattening satisfactions as being equal in prospect, by which I mean, in the radical value-free subjectivism of Mises, buying a cheeseburger from McDonald's carries the same ethical weight as a monk who chooses to spend his time deep in meditation instead. These are both simply revealed preferences. It is not for economics to say anything more. However, it strikes me that in these attempts to be value-free, there is in fact an implicit telos, which is to say end goal, smuggled in to the analysis. In Bentham and Mill, this is explicit. It is to maximize the happiness of the most individuals. In the Chicago rational choice models, the concept of happiness has been replaced by the more mechanical concept of self-interest driven by material incentives. In the Austrian conception, the normative ideas of happiness or material gains are replaced by the more neutral and subjective satisfactions, but nonetheless there is the implicit idea that a society in which the subjective satisfactions of the most individuals are fulfilled is more desirable than one in which those satisfactions are left unfulfilled. Let us study this pair of images. Now, a conservative thinker like Carl Schmitt would immediately tell you that what we see here is a classic example of the friend-enemy distinction which is at the heart of politics. This is clearly a war, but war is simply politics by another name. A strongly Christian conservative thinker, someone like Hilaire Belloc, sees an existential struggle between his own religion and that of a heathen other. In fact, Belloc lamented the fact that the Crusades had not been won by the Christians. He said, and I quote, the story must not be neglected by any modern who may think in error that the East has finally fallen before the West, that Islam is now enslaved 
to our political and economic power at any rate, if not to our philosophy. It is not so. Islam essentially survives, and Islam would not have survived had the crusade made good its hold upon the essential point of Damascus. Islam survives. Its religion is intact, therefore its material strength may return. Our religion is in peril, and who can be confident in the continued skill, let alone the continued obedience, of those who make and work our machines? There is with us a complete chaos in religious doctrine. We worship ourselves, we worship the nation, or we worship some few of us, a particular economic arrangement believed to be the satisfaction of social justice. Islam has not suffered this spiritual decline, and in the contrast between our religion's chaos and Islam's religious certitudes, still strong throughout the Mohammedan world, lies our peril. Now that speaks for itself. Let us return to the image. Other thinkers of a more Nietzschean bent would see in this an essential masculine vitality and heroism. People prepare to die for a higher purpose bigger than themselves. Now to all of this, what can the liberal or the libertarian say? Well, first, can they really draw the friend-enemy distinction or even recognise that these are two fundamentally different groups of men with fundamentally opposed beliefs about the world? Strictly speaking, if we are to hold them to their own tenets, they can see only individuals. Here we see a group of individuals. In the liberal mindset, it is easy to imagine the thought, what a waste of life. Are the satisfactions of these individuals really being served by killing each other? This is senseless. Why don't they trade? What is gained by all of this? This is a sub-optimal allocation of scarce resources which have alternative uses. These sorts of wars are what silly medieval people did who did not have our enlightened insights. Of course, now we know better. Some liberals might even look at this and lament something along the lines of this is what religion does it divides people or perhaps this is what ideology does what you are hearing in this imagined stream of consciousness i'm giving you is a modern scientific materialist mindset struggling to come to terms with the notion of a higher purpose and transcendence now there is something of this in what J. Mortimer Adler calls the 20th century delusion. Let me quote him. A cultural delusion is widespread in the 20th century. The extraordinary progress in science and technology that we have achieved in this century has deluded many of our contemporaries into thinking that similar progress obtains in other fields of mental activity. They unquestioningly think that the 20th century is superior to its predecessors in all the efforts of the human mind. Some of our contemporaries make this inference consciously and explicitly. They do not hesitate to declare that the 20th century has a better, a more advanced and sounder solution of moral and political problems, that it is more critically penetrating in its philosophical thought and that it is superior in its understanding of, and even in its wisdom about, the perennial questions that confront human beings in every generation. If we return to our image, the mindset that thinks that the Crusades were backwards, or savage, or less civilised, or a good example of how we have overcome the problems of the past, would be guilty of this. And there is at least the spirit of this progressive hubris in libertarian thinking, which seeks to avoid war at all costs and to maximise trade. But, I ask you, does the mindset that looks at this image and sees only individuals represent a significant advancement over the mindsets of Schmidt or Belloc or Nietzsche? And is it necessarily, quote-unquote, more rational. One thing that is certain, 
by looking at this image and seeing only individuals, there is an egalitarian levelling. There is the basic assumption that the men we see here are fundamentally similar enough that they put down their swords and trade goods for mutual benefit. And beyond that, that each one of these men has a personality, hopes, dreams, desires, and so on, in a different time and place, in a more enlightened age, so to speak, these hopes and dreams may have been satisfied. Maybe Ahmed here would have been better off sitting at home, eating a takeaway, and watching Married at First Sight. Certainly, his life expectancy would have been longer, and his daily nutritional intake would have been higher. Surely that's progress. I have laboured this point, but I hope you can see the difference between a mindset that sees the material world and the intellect subordinated to a higher purpose and a mindset that sees the material world as primary, with man as a slave to his passions, a kind of glorified animal who can use his intellect to make better stuff. In this second worldview, higher purposes are just puff and ideology, the stuff of propaganda and silly superstition. Let me list the ways in which libertarianism has exhibited a hidden egalitarianism thus far. First, in failing to recognise the Schmittian friend-enemy distinction, it artificially levels the field of politics into a negotiation between individuals. The failure to recognise an enemy as an enemy means that you use tactics on them such as reason, debate, discussion, compromise, trade deals and so on that you would use with a friend. This is fatal when they recognise you as an enemy but you see them only as an individual. And this is likely at the heart of why libertarian arguments get nowhere at all with socialists who do recognise this distinction. A second way in which uh, the libertarian worldview is egalitarian is in its treatment of transcendent beliefs as mere ideology. This is the Belloc point, where he recognises uh, the Christian and an outgroup, the heathen, uh, the liberal mindset can only recognise competing ideological beliefs that have an equal weighting. They merely exist as ideology as such. And this is radically levelling in itself. And this is somewhat shared with the socialist. But socialism itself functions as a kind of religion. So in a strange way, their mindset is a little bit like Belloc's also. Their heathens are the enemies of socialism. Third, where libertarians cannot understand that men can act in the service of a higher purpose, it reduces individuals to their animal passions, which is the natural end result of a way of seeing the world that can only see the satisfaction of wants and basic needs. This has been called the reign of quantity by René Gournon. And because of this, libertarianism cannot discern what he calls quality, not only between competing belief systems, but also between individuals, since their various wants and satisfactions are treated as being equal no matter who they are. The wants and satisfactions of a scumbag are the same in theory as the wants and satisfactions of a heroic warrior or a monk. This again is radically levelling. Milton Friedman often talked of the market being the most natural democracy since individuals can vote things in and out of existence with their wallets. But this gives the scumbag, the follower, the weak person, the coward and so on, as much of a say as those individuals of superior quality. The lone exception to this is the entrepreneur. But this is only because he is judged on the material output he can provide to everyone else, which is to say he makes things that people want. The entrepreneur then, if successful, 
earns the right to greater riches for himself because this is what he gets in exchange for his material service to everybody else. But who do scumbags, cowards and weak people elevate to such positions of success by voting with their wallets? And what sorts of products do these people make? I want to move on now to consider a test case. Meet the village blacksmith. Let's call him John Smith. This chap is a local master blacksmith in the pre-industrial age. His father, John Smith, was also a master blacksmith. And his father before him, John Smith, was also a master blacksmith. And he expects that his son, little John Smith, pictured here, will also be a master blacksmith. The furthest John Smith has ever travelled is to a market fair at the nearest local town. But for most of his days, John Smith has lived in this village. Now, John Smith enjoys some protections. The sale of foreign iron goods has been strictly prohibited by the king. Furthermore, John Smith is a member of the Blacksmiths Guild. This means that he is the only person allowed to practice smithing in this village. If local farmers want to get some horseshoes, they must go to John Smith. For this reason, he seldom changes his prices much. If his suppliers of steel and iron increase their prices, his prices go up. If they drop down again, he can afford in the interests of honesty and fairness to his good friends who buy his products, drop them down again. In fact, the Guild has rules in place that forbid John Smith from making illicit profits from his products, or indeed from dropping them down so low that people from other villages would travel to his smith rather than buying from their local Guild member. So. He does not have much leeway here in any case. But even if these rules were not in place, it is not in John Smith's nature to seek more. He is happy making an honest living. Will he ever branch out and get a second shop? No. Will he ever make wildly more money than he does already? No. But this is not John Smith's purpose. His purpose is to sell horseshoes and tools in the local community. And this makes him fulfilled as it made his father and his father before him fulfilled. As it will fulfill little John Smith, his son. It is what God wants. It is what his local Lord wants. It is what the guild wants. It is what the king wants. So be it. All is good with the world. John Smith will live and die in this village, never dreaming of more. Now, to the liberal mindset, much of this is repugnant. First, why should John Smith's little son be a blacksmith too? What if little John wants to be something else? What if little John wants to become a scholar or a painter? or a dancer, or a singer? What if little John wants to express himself and be more than a mere blacksmith? This seems fundamentally unfair. There's no social mobility for little John. Justice for little John. Note that this is not the socialist speaking, but the libertarian. Little John and his father exist in a state of genuine unfreedom by the libertarian definition. And this in itself feels wrong to the libertarian. Little John is trapped inside a caste system. I'll just note in passing that this is yet another way in which libertarian thought is radically egalitarian. The mindset of John Smith simply accepts that Little John is of a particular caste. He is simply a type of person who will be a blacksmith. He's of blacksmith stock. Why wouldn't he be a blacksmith? As distinct from a peasant or his lord or a priest. It is what God wants. It is what the king wants. It is what the Lord wants. And it is ultimately what John Smith and what little John want. 
so be it. Amen. But the liberal mind cannot handle this. It sees only individuals here. The son of John Smith may be better suited to being something else. Also, why should the son of the Lord get to be the Lord? What's he done to deserve it? It's so unfair. So, in the libertarian worldview, the situation on the left here just won't do. This is not only radically egalitarian in the vertical sense, the axis with the Lord at the top and the peasant at the bottom, but also in the much less discussed horizontal sense, in which the libertarian is displeased with the idea that people should not be able to pick their own jobs along a continuum of jobs of roughly equal social standing. Why should little John be a blacksmith? Maybe he wants to be an actor or a scholar or any number of other things. I would like to suggest in 2021 that most people dislike the pressure and uncertainty of not knowing what they will do in their lives and that there are significant costs imposed by the freedom to choose. I wonder how much anxiety is induced by people feeling that they never found something they were good at, that they never found their niche in life, that they never achieved what they wanted to. And this is the downside of the freedom. I wonder how many would exchange the pressure and the uncertainty and the anxiety for the static but relatively safe and stable situation of little John. It is a question to be asked, but there can be no doubt about which side of this issue the libertarians must be on. And on all of these matters, the socialists are largely in full agreement. I mean, after all, why should little John be denied the chance of becoming a cross-dressing porn star? Anyway, even beyond the life choices of little John, there are more liberal objections to this situation. What about the money being left on the table by John Smith? Where is his ambition? If it were not for the restrictions and the price controls put in place by that awful blacksmith's guild, he might max out his profits and finally expand his smithery. Possibly he might open a second branch in a nearby village. The competition would do the neighbouring blacksmith good. Also, think about the technological stagnation induced by this arrangement. John Smith is using practically the same tools as his grandfather. There have been virtually no gains in the productive output of this smithery for decades. It's a study in stagnation. It has been a supramarginal firm for over a hundred years just about turning over enough money to feed this man's family and little more. It's a disaster. There's no capital investment. Furthermore, if the guild was abolished and these stupid restrictions were removed, we might finally see some economies of scale. The smithery might be replaced by the factory, which can produce many more iron and steel products at a reduced per unit cost, greatly increasing output. Everyone would be better off for this. Everyone. And if John Smith finds himself put out of business, perhaps his and little John Smith's talents could be, could be put to better, more productive uses. And even beyond that, what about this total ban on foreign iron goods? Perhaps another country can make even more goods at a lower price again, and everyone will benefit further. I would now like to put the theoretical libertarian argument, um, and for this let's use Mises, who would definitely make these arguments against the traditionalist, and then let's use Thomas Carlyle, who would definitely have opposed these arguments, as our banner cases. Mises, um, I'm going to put the pro arguments for abolishing the guild and the foreign import ban into the mouth of Mises, while Carlyle will make the anti arguments. Mises would argue along these lines. He would say abolishing the guild and the foreign import restrictions would, one, reduce the prices of iron goods benefiting everyone. Two, it will 
greatly increase the efficiency of the production process. Three, it will greatly increase the range and the total amount of iron goods produced. Four, it will enhance technology, thereby freeing up labour to be put to more productive uses, which can then make more goods in other areas, for example. And five, these changes will enhance the comfort and the quality of life for all, leading people like John Smith to live longer and to have more material wealth. Hurrah! Now to this, one can imagine Thomas Carlyle flying into a fit of rage. He'd practically have a seizure and he'd argue along these lines. One, it will condemn poor John Smith and his family and all similar blacksmiths across the country to a life of abject nomadism, thereby removing the certainty, security and sense of spiritual fulfillment their calling as a master blacksmith gave them. Two, it will disrupt the village way of life that has endured for centuries and sever forever the social bonds that tied these people together in a community. The bond between John Smith and his friend. The bond between John Smith and his fellow guild members. As well as the bond between John Smith and his local lord. And beyond that, the bond between the people of the nation and the king. Three, it will take away the dignity and the pride of the master blacksmith, who must now be condemned to work as a mere factory labourer. Four, it will reduce the quality of goods, which will now be the product of ghastly mass industrial processes, rather than made lovingly by the master blacksmith. And fifth, the material gains, the gains in material wealth and health are mere trinkets celebrated by bean counters. Puh. These gains cannot offset the spiritual loss. In the long run, people will lament what has been lost forever. Mark my words. Now it's ultimately up to you to decide whose arguments you are more persuaded by. But it is my contention that the libertarian arguments here are predicated on egalitarian and materialist principles, which are the result of pure rationalism. Whereas those on the side of Carlyle are predicated on transcendent anti-rationalist and idealist notions that simply cannot be quantified with a total acceptance of hierarchy and even caste baked in to uh, his uh, assumptions. Now, of course, one trick that libertarians have up their sleeves here is simply to redefine socialism as any opposition to the free market whatsoever, which would end up labeling the likes of Carlyle as a socialist or as a kind of socialist. In fact, the aforementioned Hans Hermann Hopper does just this in his book, A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism, in the chapter, The Socialism of Conservatism. Now, Hopper has some different positions later on when he came to reject the Whig view of history. But here we find him peddling that view of history to some extent. I think there's an interesting moment in this chapter in which we find the younger Hopper struggling with the natural right winger within himself and coming to terms with the fact that he might be peddling absolute horseshit. Let's read a bit of it and I will uh, comment as we go on. He says, roughly speaking, before the 18th century in Europe and throughout the world, a social system of feudalism or absolutism, which was in fact feudalism on a grander scale, existed. In abstract terms, the social order of feudalism was characterized by a regional overlord who claimed ownership of some territory, including all of its resources and goods, and quite often also all of the men placed upon it, without having originally appropriated them himself through use or work, and without having a contractual claim to them. 
On the contrary, the territory, or better, the various parts of it and the good standing on it, had been actively occupied, used and produced by different people before the natural owners. The ownership claims of the feudal lords were thus derived from thin air. Now, note that his description thus far has been purely materialist, and he reduces the profound medieval belief in the great chain of being to thin air. Centuries of accumulated wisdom dismissed and delegitimated in two words. Let's continue. Hence, the practice based on these alleged ownership rights of renting land and other production factors out to the natural owners in return for goods and services, unilaterally fixed by the overlord, had to be enforced against the will of these natural owners by brutal force and armed violence, with the help of a noble caste of military men who were awarded by the overlord for their services by being allowed to participate and share in his exploitative methods and proceeds. For the common man, subject to this order, life meant tyranny, exploitation, economic stagnation, poverty, starvation and despair. Note that this is merely asserted by Hopper and if you follow up his sources you'll find that the French Annal School historian Marc Bloch and the explicitly Marxist Trotskyite historian Perry Anderson, one of the leading figures in the British New Left in the 1970s and the 1980s, are his sources. And also Rodney Hilton, another explicitly Marxist historian and a member of the New Left. Thus we see, when it comes to challenging the old order in the service of liberalism, Hopper, at least in the early 1990s, thought nothing of drawing on the Marxist progressive vision of history to weave a narrative. But is it true that the peasantry lived under quote-unquote tyranny, exploitation, economic stagnation, poverty, starvation and despair? Well, let's read on. He says, as one might be expected, there was resistance to this system. Interestingly enough, though, from the present day perspective, it was not the peasant population who suffered most from the existing order, but the merchants and traders who became the leading opponents of the feudal system. Hmm, hold on. It wasn't the peasants who suffered most from, quote, tyranny, exploitation, economic stagnation, poverty, starvation and despair. What? Uh, come again? They were living under tyranny and despair, but it was the merchants and the traders who suffered most. Does that pass the sniff test? Does that sound coherent? Let's continue. Buying at a lower price in one place and travelling and selling at a higher price in a different place, as they did, made their subordination to any one feudal lord relatively weak. They were essentially a class of international men crossing the borders of various feudal territories constantly. As such, in order to do business, they required a stable, internationally valid legal system, a system of rules valid regardless of time and place, defining property and contract, which would facilitate the evolution of the institutions of credit, banking and insurance essential to any large-scale trading business. Naturally, this caused friction between the merchants and the feudal lords as representatives of various arbitrary regional legal systems. The merchants became feudalism's outcasts, permanently threatened and harassed by the noble military caste attempting to bring them under control. In order to escape this threat, the merchants were forced to organise themselves and help establish small fortified trading places at the very fringes of the centres of feudal power. As places of partial extraterritoriality and at least partial freedom, 
they soon attracted growing numbers of the peasantry running away from feudal exploitation and economic misery and they grew into small towns, fostering the development of crafts and productive enterprises which could not have emerged in the surroundings of exploitation and legal instability characteristic of the feudal order itself. This process was more pronounced where the feudal powers were relatively weak and where power was dispersed among a great number of often very minor rival feudal lords. It was in the cities of northern Italy, the cities of the Hanseatic League and those of Flanders that the spirit of capitalism first blossomed and commerce and production reached their highest levels. But this partial emancipation from the restrictions and the stagnation of feudalism was only temporary and was followed by reaction and decline. This was due in part to internal weaknesses in the movement of the new merchant class itself. Still, too much ingrained in the minds of men was the feudal way of thinking, in terms of different ranks assigned to people, of subordination and power, and of order having to be imposed upon men through coercion. Hence, in the newly emerging commercial centres, a new set of non-contractual regulations and restrictions, now of bourgeois origin, were soon established. Guilds that restrained free competition were formed, and a new merchant oligarchy arose. More important, though, for this reactionary process was yet another fact. In their endeavour to free themselves from the exploitative interventions of various feudal lords, the merchants had to look for natural allies and we will stop there. I'd like to suggest here that the reason the system kept reverting back to the older order was not because the people had to be quote coerced into it but rather because as Hopper himself notes there was an ingrained belief system which far from being artificially maintained by force was in fact natural and normal. Little John Smith was quite fulfilled in his feudal life and things worked in harmony before those pesky merchants turned up and started to change everything. And this is something that Hopper himself realised partly when he came to write Democracy the God That Failed and in the essays that make up the first part of the great fiction. He realised that the foundations of liberalism and its origin story, so to speak, were built on a lie. But Hopper was practically expelled from polite libertarian circles thereafter and denounced by Geoffrey Tucker, who has since gone out on to write hit piece after hit piece on important right-wing thinkers such as the aforementioned Carlyle and Julius Eveler, making sure to label them as fascists in his titles. But if you read those pieces, I think they belie a fundamental shallowness and emptiness in Tucker's own thought, incapable of even understanding where these men were coming from, which, if nothing else, is a failure of intellectual imagination. Hopefully, this video and the preceding two have given everyone a lot to chew on. I am pleased that the first two videos have stirred quite a lot of debate. I have noted that they have upset some people who see this as something of betrayal. Please understand, I am not making this series to be destructive or to turn on libertarians or anything like that, but rather to sum up my thoughts on how we've ended up where we are right now. We need to come to terms with the fact that the left keep winning and something isn't right. It's in that spirit that I offer these critiques. I recognise many libertarians are friends and not enemies. I have agreed to discuss this further on a stream with Radical Liberation next week, hopefully on his weekly econ chat stream, but details are to be decided. In the meantime, let me know what you think. I greatly appreciate your comments and I do try to read them all. Thanks for watching. Are you sick of hearing about Marx and Keynes? Do you want to know why neoclassical economics is so flawed? Have you ever wondered how to work out the marginal productivity of a burger bun? Do you want to level up your econ knowledge? Buy it now. £350. 
foundations of economics. Foundations of economics. I'm here. Foundations of economics. Get it now. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out. If you like Academic Agent's content on this channel, sign up for a course on the Academic Agency. He's now offering Foundations of Economics. Click the link in the show description and level up your econ knowledge. My recent trilogy of videos, Issues with Libertarian Arguments Against Socialism, continue to have ripple effects across the community. One of the best ripples, so to speak, has been a new series launched by Nathan Hood, looking at the epistemological origins of liberalism. The first of those is out now, and I'd strongly recommend checking that out. It's an excellent introduction, and I've put a note to it in the show notes. However, another ripple has been the sheer number of people pointing out that life would have been worse back in medieval times for our old friend John Smith, the blacksmith. So in this video, I want to challenge those people clinging on to their Enlightenment propaganda by comparing 1381 John Smith to his counterpart, John Smith, in the 1800s, using the very metrics of liberalism itself, which is to say, material measures as opposed to the transcendent values which are beyond measure and which were much more deeply felt by 1381 John Smith. I am going to be comparing them on the following metrics. Wealth, leisure time, calorie intake, cost of living and productivity. Surely this is an absolute slam dunk for the industrial 19th century, no? Surely the age of the bean counter against which Thomas Carlyle raged marked a significant material advance over the medieval era, no? Well, let's take a look. All of the data I'll be presenting here is taken from the book British Economic Growth 1270 to 1870 by Stephen Broadbury and Friends, published by Cambridge University Press. So in this first graph, we see plotted real wages as a ratio against GDP per capita over time. Oh look, the line goes down. Line go down. In other words, as GDP per capita rose across Europe, real wages as a percentage of GDP per capita fell. Here's the situation in Jest, England. I'm afraid 1800s John Smith is not looking so hot. In fact, if we isolate 1381 John Smith against 1800s John Smith, even taking the peak of the 1800s in this data set, 1381 John Smith is easily 50% ahead, if not more. Yes, it is true that the overall economy was bigger in the 1800s than in the 1380s, but there were also many more people. And so, in 1381, John Smith had a greater share of the wealth of his nation than 1800s John Smith. Now, I know history fans will be screaming at the screen now that the 1380s were just a few years after the Black Death, while the 1800s were experiencing a massive population boom induced by the Industrial Revolution. But so what? These two facts reflect the competing value systems of tradition and progressive liberalism. 1381 John Smith saw death as a fact of life. Milk toast moderns try to avoid death at all cost, as we have seen during the pandemic. But the trade-off for trying to keep every last person alive for longer and longer is that each person has a smaller share in the wealth and so is worse off from that point of view. 
Now, let us consider leisure time. Unfortunately, we do not have average days worked for 1381. The closest we can get is 1433, and that will have to be close enough. Although there is good reason to believe that the actual number for 1381 would have been lower than the number that we see here. As you can see from these statistics, the average days worked per person in 1433 was 165, while the average for the 1800s is around 320, a dramatic increase. 1381, John Smith enjoyed up to 200 days of leisure time a year, while his 19th century counterpart enjoyed only 45 days, and this is including weekends. This means that 1381 John Smith had a staggering 344% more leisure time than 1800's John Smith. Now you could argue that 1381 John Smith was 344% more free than 1800's John Smith. Next, let us look at calorie intake. We have a good view of dairy and butter production across this whole period. Now, they were making good Welsh salted butter even back then. As we can see here, 38.77 million gallons of milk was the total output for the 1380s. But bear in mind, this was only 2.36 million people. Obviously, milk output in the 1800s was many times greater than that. But also consider that the economy had to serve a population that was many times greater and growing all the time. Now, thankfully, Broadberry and Co. have given us some metrics to make direct comparisons across these periods. Here we see total population against average food intake across various groups with uh, calculated calorie intakes. I have highlighted our man, 1381 John Smith, and put a box around the 1800s figures. Notice that the 1380s are even above the 1860s here, which is where the data set ends. If you take an average of the 1800s, the typical worker would be getting around 2,173 calories, while in 1381 it would have been around 2,467 or 13.5% more. So 1381 John Smith was better fed than 1800s John Smith. Now, if we drill down into John Smith's shopping bill, John Smith, as a blacksmith, would have been classed as a craftsman. So he was above your typical uh, labourer in the hierarchy of that day. On this table, the closest we can get to him is the building craftsman, who we can use as a fairly safe proxy for the blacksmith. Um, it's possible that in any given moment, a, a blacksmith would have been paid more than a building craftsman or less, but let's just use it as a rough measure. Broadbury and Co. give us two different metrics here. First is the bare bones basket, which contains oats and just enough food to get by, very little in the way of luxury items. In other words, if you're getting the bare bones basket, you're just above the bread line, you're, uh, you are basically subsistence living if you're on the, the bare bones basket. Then they give us a second basket, the respectability basket, which contains bread made of wheat, candles, and certain uh, luxury goods. The metric is given for buying these goods for a family of three for a whole year. Now, 1381 John Smith, circled on the left here, if he worked 200 days a year, would be able to afford one and a fifth respectability baskets for his family with his income or he could get three and a third bare bones baskets 1800s john smith meanwhile represented here by 1801 and 1803 the only data given cannot afford the respectability basket for the whole year he's on 0 0.96 if you see and he can just about manage three bare bones baskets uh if he worked 200 days so 1381 John Smith is 27% better off in terms of the respectability basket and almost 10% better off in terms of the bare bones basket. In either case, his money went further than 1800 John Smith. 
And finally, we come to the area in which one would imagine that 1800s John Smith might annihilate 1381 John Smith, productivity. Well, again, hold your horses, Stephen Pinker, because if we take blacksmiths as being part of the industrial sector and making tools and whatnot, they surely were part of the industrial sector. If you take per worker output relative to the economy as a whole, 1381 John Smith was contributing a lot more on a per capita basis than 1800s John Smith. Well, of course, overall 19th century industrial production greatly outperformed medieval production. That's not in question, but that's not what we're measuring here. What we're measuring is John Smith's personal contribution to the economy as a percentage. And on that metric, 1381, John Smith is 113% more productive than 1800s John Smith. So to summarize, 1381 John Smith has scored a flawless victory. Flawless victory. Against 1800s John Smith in all five areas. Now I can see people complaining that I've cherry picked data points to tell a story here to fit a certain narrative if you want, but you know, that's facts and logic, isn't it? The Enlightenment likes to tell a story about history, but it really depends on which facts you tease out and which narrative you want to tell. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years. From the time of Aristotle, through to the medieval schoolmen, right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out. If you like Academic Agents content on this channel, sign up for a course on the Academic Agency. He's now offering Foundations of Economics. Click the link in the show description and level up your econ knowledge. In this video, I'm going to be considering Stephen Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. Now, I should say that those of you who saw my much older video, Ultimate Red Pill Books, uh, will note that I recommended in that Stephen Pinker's The Blank Slate and I still stand by that recommendation. The Blank Slate is a good book. However, in this video, I'm going to be questioning the central thesis of this book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which is nowhere near the standard of uh, the earlier work, The Blank Slate. Now, one of the things I want to do is to question the central premise of the book, that violence has declined. Now to do this, I'm going to ignore the more egregious moves that Pinker makes in the book when he tries to explain away, for example, the massive death toll of the 20th century uh, and the two world wars and the atrocities of Hitler and Stalin. Um, I'm not going to go into that question. It has been done elsewhere uh, and to better effect than I can manage. But make of the table that I've screen grabbed here what you will. I want to focus on two questions. First, I'm interested in Pinker's claims about medieval England being many times more violent than modern England and also about Pinker's claims uh, concerning colonial New England and its so-called civilizing process. Let me just quote uh, from near the start of Pinker's book. He says in 1981, the political scientist Ted Robert Gurr, using old court and county records, calculated 30 estimates of homicide rates at various times in English history, combined them with modern records from London, and plotted them on a graph. I've reproduced it in figure 3-1 using a logarithmic scale in which the same vertical distance separates 1 from 10 and 10 from 100 and 100 from 1000. The rate is calculated in the same way 
as in the preceding chapter, namely the number of killings per 100,000 people per year. The log scale is necessary because the homicide rate declines so precipitously. The graph shows that from the 13th century to the 20th, homicide in various parts of England plummeted by a factor of 10, 50, and in some cases 100. For example, from 110 homicides per 100,000 people per year in 14th century Oxford to less than one homicide per 100,000 in mid 20th century London. The graph stunned almost everyone who saw it, including me, as I mentioned in the preface. It was the seed that grew into this book. The discovery confounds every stereotype about the idyllic past and the degenerate present. When I surveyed perceptions of violence in an internet questionnaire, people guessed that 20th century England was about 14% more violent than 14th century England. In fact, it was 95% less violent. And here's a look at his amazing graph, uh, reproduced from Gurr, which uh, I'll just leave there for you to take a look at in your own time. Now, before I uh, get into looking at this data a bit more closely, Pinker borrows his thesis from Norbert Elias's The Civilizing Process, written in 1939, which has this idea that um, there's been a kind of cultural evolution that has driven rates of violence down as governments have become more and more centralised and uh, this has been a civilizing process, according to uh, Pinker. Now, this statistic about uh, the homicide rate in, 13, uh, in the 1340s being around 110 per 100,000 has been repeated in uh, many places. Uh, you know, when you just give a quick Google of what was the homicide rate in the Middle Ages, uh, many pages like this come up and then they cite uh, Pinker. I even caught uh, BBC GCSE bite size history, uh, you know, peddling this statistic. Um, so the first question to ask, of course, is, well, how representative is this uh, one statistic taken from Oxford in the 1340s of the period? How typical of the era is it? Well, Michael Eisner, who is one of Pinker's key sources, gives a rate for the 1300s in general, uh, a number around 79% below the headline number of 110 per 100,000 that Pinker cites. Uh, if you have a look at his graph here, um, in 1300, it's 23 per 100,000, uh, according to Eisner, nowhere near the 110 uh, per 100,000 that Pinker uses. It's a much smaller number. Uh, however, if we drill down even further, Randolph Roth, another one of the key sources of Pinker's, shows that the homicide rates in the 1200s, just a century before that, were well below uh, even 23. Yeah, you, can have a, you can have a look at these numbers here, 9.8 uh, in Bedford in 1222, uh, 16.8, 50 years later. Uh, in Kent, they were 8.7 uh, in 1250. And then you can see Oxford does seem to be above the general level, but it's still only 22.4, uh, 19.7 in Oxford um, in uh, the middle of uh, the 1200s. So that 110 per 100,000 stat that is peddled around and repeated all over the internet seems like an outlier number, not actually typical of the era. And if you look, major cities at that time, like Bristol or London, had an even lower uh, homicide rate again, 5.9 per 100,000 uh, in Bristol, 6.4 per 100,000 uh, in London. And this is taken from Roth who, as far as I can make out, is one of the um, leading authorities on the topic of homicide through history, especially in uh, England and uh, North America. Uh, he seems to be the go-to guy for this, and we'll be hearing more from him 
uh, as we go forward. Pinker uses him, but Pinker seems to ignore his actual ideas, as we'll see. So another question to ask after asking, you know, is 110 per 100,000 a fair reflection of the Middle Ages uh, for violence is also, is homicide even a good measure of civilization? The homicide stat itself, does it really tell us how civilized a society is or even how violent a society is? Using Pinker's logic, Bristol in the year 1221, which had a homicide rate of 5.9, was 70% more civilized than the USA in 1990, 388% more civilized than Brazil in 2017, and many times more civilized than South Africa or Central America in either year. So, you know, you can cherry pick both ways is the point I'm trying to make. Um, he has cherry picked 110 per 100,000 from all of the available statistics and highlighted that to show a straight line going down to today. And if you note, he compared Oxford to London uh, when he did that uh, comparison. But there's nothing stopping uh, somebody else coming along and finding different data points from today and saying, well, hold on a second. Uh, this is many times higher than the one in Bristol. So it's not conclusive one way or the other when you start playing that game of cherry picking uh, stats. Um, another thing to point out is that if you go into and the documentation for this is quite robust, it's freely available online. Uh, a lot of it is the work of, uh, of Roth, who seems a very honest academic to me. Um, you, you can actually see what each of these homicides uh, were. And in the case of Bedfordshire uh, and surrounding areas, a lot of the homicides were instances of what I would call private justice. You know, somebody being robbed and killing somebody in self-defense, for example. Um, you can see that some of them were people resisting arrest. Uh, one of them was a, was a father trying to save his daughter from attempted rape. So these are many cases where today, of course, most people just ring the police uh, when faced with a situation like this. Uh, whereas back then there was more uh, private justice. And this is part of Pinker's argument, the distinction between uh, the violence being in the hands of the state uh, versus be violence being in the hands of private individuals. He sees it uh, as better. Uh, in the second scenario. But let's just pretend that in each of these cases, the police turned up and arrested somebody and put them into jail. That doesn't actually show that people are any less violent today than they uh, would have been in the 1200s. It just shows that we have a more reactive police force. But then Roth goes on to uh, note a few other things. I, I think it's worth reading what he says. He says, Note, however, that probably half of all homicide victims in medieval England would have survived today with the help of modern emergency services, surgery, wound care, antisepsis and antibiotics. So even if we assume a 73% undercount of the Erie records, the rate at which people suffered life-threatening assaults in medieval England would be comparable to the homicide rate in the United States from the late 1960s through the early 1990s, which averaged around nine per 100,000 per year. And it would be far lower than the rate in the Russian Federation since the collapse of the Soviet Union, which rose to 35 to 40 per 100,000 persons per year. So it's interesting, isn't it? The homicide rate in England at that time was a little bit like that of the USA in the late 20th century. And also modern science would have saved half of those people who were killed. So how much is modern medicine masking the extent to which people are violent today? Well, just so happens we have very good statistics on these things. Knife crime in modern London is 176 per 100,000. It's old Sadiq Khan, of course. If only one eighth of those knife crimes would have resulted in a death in 1300, the homicide rate today would be equal to the peak of the homicide rate in the Middle 
ages, which if you remember was around 23 per 100,000 according to Manuel Eisner. So the point I'm trying to make here is, did we get less violent or is it simply that medicine was better able to treat wounds that previously would have been fatal? I leave that for you to ponder, but it strikes me that uh, there are many uh, areas in which we can question uh, Pinker's thesis so far and also his methods. I mean, I got the impression all the way through the book that he was playing fast and loose and that such games of statistical trickery can be played both ways, uh, as I've been trying to show you throughout this video. I think we've reached peak wank. Are you sick of hearing about Marx and Keynes? Do you want to know why neoclassical economics is so flawed? Have you ever wondered how to work out the marginal productivity of a burger bun? Do you want to level up your econ knowledge? Buy it now. £350. Foundations of Economics. Foundations of Economics. I'm here. Foundations of Economics. Get it now. It's a very nice village, but it's a bit scattered. It's a bit scattered. Awfully scattered. Next, Pinker turns his attention to New England, and he uses uh, colonial New England and uh, the establishment of the American government and so on as a good example of what he calls the civilizing process in action, reducing the homicide rate from over 100 per 100,000 in 1637 to less than one per 100,000 by the 1820s. New England had an exceptionally low uh, homicide rate, perhaps uh, according to Roth, the lowest in the entire world uh, in the 19th century. Where does that 100 per 100,000 number for 1637 come from? How, how are we working out that in 1637 that many people were killed uh, by, by homicide? And the source for it is, again, Randolph Roth, who explains the number as follows. He says... The struggle for trade and territory was also indirectly responsible for many homicides because of its corrosive impact on public morality and social institutions. Whites and Indians, singly or in groups, imitated the behaviour of tribes and nations. They took goods, seized land, killed anyone, native or colonist, who stood in their way and felt justified in doing so. Colonial authorities reported numerous robbery murders, vigilante murders and revenge murders, which flourished where neither natives nor colonists could gain the upper hand and establish political control. Together, such homicides accounted for a third of the known murders of English colonists in the early years of colonization. The other two thirds were political murders or other kinds of murders among people who knew one another. The lack of a common legal or law enforcement system and the refusal in most instances of rival tribes and nations to accept the legitimacy of one another systems meant that criminals were almost certain to get away with murder and that the friends and relatives of murder victims had little hope of obtaining justice. And that's in the book American Homicide, uh, which has got many more facts and stats if you're interested. The fact is, though, that this 100 per 100,000 number is not exactly fair, is it? Because you're dealing with groups of people who are formally at war or else openly competing for resources. This is pretty much uh, a state of civil war. So I, I do think it's a little bit tricksy for Pinker to use this as his uh, starting point uh, for New England. Now, Pinker sees the sharp decline of the homicide rate in New England as evidence of his thesis. He says, after this consolidation of state control, the curves for Old England and New England coincide uncannily. The rest of the North East also saw a plunge from triple digit and high double digit homicide rates to the single digits typical 
of the world's countries today. Now, before I go on, I think it's worth uh, pointing out that elsewhere in the book, Pinker takes great pains to emphasize the cruelty of both the medieval world and of Christianity. He says medieval Christendom was a culture of cruelty. Torture was meted out by national and local governments throughout the continent, and it was codified in laws that prescribed blinding, branding, amputation of hands, ears, noses and tongues, and other forms of mutilation as punishments for minor crimes. Executions were orgies of sadism, climaxing with ordeals of prolonged killing, such as burning at the stake, breaking on the wheel, pulling apart by horses, impalement through the rectum, disembowelment by winding a man's intestines around a spool, and even hanging, which was a slow wrecking and strangulation rather than a quick breaking of the neck. Sadistic tortures were also inflicted by the Christian church during its inquisitions, witch hunts, and religious wars. Torture had been authorised by the ironically named Pope Innocent IV in 1252, one and the order of Dominican monks carried it out with relish as the inquisition coffee table book notes under pope paul the 4th 1555 to 59 the inquisition was downright insatiable paul a dominican and one-time grand inquisitor was himself a fervent and skilled practitioner of torture and atrocious mass murders talents for which he was elevated to sainthood in 1712. And I'd say this passage is fairly typical of the way in which Pinker relishes attacking Christianity again and again as he does throughout this book. Uh, I could have picked out many other passages of this uh, kind but uh, I went with this one. He also um, even tries to tie Christianity to the Nazis. He says, defenders of religion claim that the two genocidal ideologies of the 20th century, fascism and communism, were atheistic, but the first claim is mistaken and the second irrelevant. Fascism happily coexisted with Catholicism in Spain, so he just outright calls Franco a fascist, but many people in the available literature on fascism do question that uh, claim. Uh, in Italy, Portugal, so he's calling Salazar uh, a fascist essentially, and Croatia. And though Hitler had little use for Christianity, he was by no means an atheist and professed that he was carrying out a divine plan. Historians have documented that many of the Nazi elite melded Nazism and German Christianity in a syncretic faith drawing on its millennial visions and its long history of anti-Semitism. Many Christian clerics and their flocks were all too happy to sign up, finding common cause with the Nazis in their opposition to the tolerant, secular, cosmopolitan culture of the Weimar era. And you know, it's kind of funny because Pinker's own data shows that the homicide rate under the mid-century Germans was lower than the homicide rate under the Weimar Republic, and also that Mussolini greatly reduced the homicide rate in Italy uh, during the 1920s and 1930s. So, uh, you know, by his own metrics, those fascist states uh, were more civilized, quote unquote, than the liberal democracies that preceded them. No. But anyway, let's take a look at his civilizing process in more detail. Pinker's argument for the decline of homicides from 1637 to the mid-1800s in New England amounts to step one, establish state control, step two, watch the line go down. That's more or less Pinker's claim. Now one of Pinker's sources I noted in the book is uh, one of my favourite books, Albion Seed by David Hackett Fisher. And according to Fisher, comparatively low rates of violent crime persisted in New England for 300 years and more. Timothy Dwight observed that most people throughout this region never bothered to bar their houses or to keep their valuables under lock and key, even in seaport towns. A lawyer 
in Beverly, Massachusetts, wrote in 1840 that during a practice of nearly 40 years, he had never known a native of Beverly convicted of any heinous crime. Harriet Beecher Stowe believed that New England, in her generation, was a place where one could go to sleep at all hours of day or night with the door wide open without bolt or bar, yet without apprehension of any to molest or make afraid. So it seems that Pinker's thesis is being borne out, isn't it? Look how civilised they were in the mid-19th century there after the civilising process had taken place. It's like magic, isn't it? But how was this achieved? And Fisher goes in to exquisite detail here. He says, first it was achieved by private means. Uh, they had a dual idea of the depravity of infants and the perversity of their natural will, which led Puritans to the conclusion that the first and most urgent purpose of child rearing was what they called the breaking of the will. This was a determined effort to destroy a spirit of autonomy in a small child, a purpose which lay near to the centre of child rearing in Massachusetts. And uh, that uh, picture there is of uh, a sign that was made for a boy who whispered and they made him wear this uh, sign all day around his neck to stop him whispering uh, as one of the efforts to break his will. But it was also achieved through public means. Fisher again says New England was characterised by a curious paradox. This was always the most orderly region in British America, but it was also very violent in its ordering acts. This typically Puritan paradox of private order and public violence was specially striking in the 17th and 18th centuries. For many generations, individual order coexisted with an institutional savagery that appeared in the burning of rebellious servants, the maiming of political dissenters, the hanging of Quakers, the execution of witches, and the crushing to death with heavy stones of an old man who refused to plead before the court. The Massachusetts laws against burglary were exceptionally severe, and court proceedings still more so. Penalties were arranged in a hierarchy of official violence. The most terrible punishment in Massachusetts was burning at the stake. The punishment for cases of petty treason, which were defined as the killing of masters by servants. At least two people were burnt alive in Massachusetts. Both were black women, a slave named Maria, who was found guilty in 1681 of setting fire to her master's house in the town of Roxbury, and a slave called Phyllis, who was burned in Cambridge for having poisoned her master with arsenic. The next most terrible punishment was death by hanging. The colony of Massachusetts recognised 13 capital crimes in 1648, witchcraft, idolatry, blasphemy, homicide, rape, adultery, bestiality, sodomy, false witness with intent to take life, and a child of 16 who was a stubborn or rebellious son or who smote or cursed a parent. All of these laws were drawn from the Pentateuch, except for the punishments for rape. Next to hanging, in point of violence, were punishments by maiming, the slitting of the nostrils, the amputation of ears, the branding of the face or hands. All of these terrible penalties were administered by the Puritans in Massachusetts. Quakers, for example, were punished with special ferocity. Some were branded in the face and burned uh, very keep with a red hot iron with H for heresy. Others had their ears cut off, faces scarred and nostrils slit open in a saturnalia of sadistic punishment. For less serious offences, the penalty was whipping unless one could pay a fine. These punishments were sometimes very severe. Four Quaker women were ordered to be stripped to the waist, 
tied to a cart's tail and conveyed from constable to constable through twelve New England towns and to be whipped in every town. The women were flogged so terribly that the blood cursed down their naked backs and breasts until the horrified townsmen of Salisbury rose against the constables and rescued them. One male Quaker missionary was flogged nearly to death in Massachusetts and Puritan minister John Norton made a joke of it. He endeavoured to beat the gospel ordinances black and blue and it was but just to beat him black and blue. So I ask you is it accurate to suggest as Pinker does that Puritan New England was 100 times less violent than England in the 1300s? Well, you can be the judge of that. Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature is little more than statistical trickery and narrative weaving of a kind that I find extremely disappointing from uh, this author. Roth has shown that homicide rates everywhere fluctuate. Uh, here, for example, is Corsica, and you can see how it goes up and down at different times. It is common to see homicide rates fall for a period but then rise again or vice versa. So on the left here, uh, Roth is showing homicide rates in 19th century England. You can see how they go up and down at different uh, moments. Uh, on the right, he's, the top line that you can see with that U shape is uh, the homicide rate in the USA. Uh, it fell for a bit uh, in the 1940s and 50s and then it rose sharply in the 1960s as we all know. So Roth, uh, who spent his entire life uh, studying this, unlike Pinker, who is a dilettante who comes in just to write this one book on violence to push his uh, liberal progressive agenda, uh, he argues that there are four factors that dictate the homicide rate of a given area and it has absolutely nothing to do with what Pinker calls the civilizing process. It's not some evolving thing where the homicide rate just keeps on going down and down. Uh, obviously you know anybody who's been paying attention throughout this video can see that the homicide rate does not just keep on going down and down across the world. Um, he says, as I put it in my own work, there have been four principal correlates of low homicide rates in North America and Western Europe over the past 450 years. Number one, the belief that government is stable and that its legal judicial institutions are unbiased and will redress wrongs and protect lives and property. Two, a feeling of trust in government and the officials who run it and the belief in their legitimacy. From this, I'd expect the uh, homicide rate to be rising in America anytime soon. Uh, three, patriotism, empathy, and fellow feeling arising from racial, religious, or political solidarity. Again, I'd expect to see the homicide rate rising all across Europe because those things are in decline. Four, the belief that the social hierarchy is legitimate, that one's position in society is or can be satisfactory, and that one can command the respect of owners without resorting to violence. Now you will have to decide for yourselves whether you think these four factors explain things better than Pinker does, but for me Roth can explain why the homicide rate may go up or down at a given time, whereas Pinker cannot. Pinker has to try to explain away any time the line goes the other way because he expects it to be evolutionary and progressive. And at no time in the book does he, for example, try to explain why the uh, homicide rate in somewhere like South Africa, which is a reasonably rich nation with a democracy, so it ticks all of his boxes, why that is so high compared to other places. He just doesn't go there. In fact, when he does mention South Africa in the book, it's just to uh, make this very woolly statement. He says, in South Africa, the apartheid regime will be dismantled 
and the white minority will cede power to the black majority. This will happen with no civil war, no bloodbath, no violent recriminations against the former oppressors. Everything's hunky-dory, uh, according to Pinker's worldview there uh, in South Africa. Uh, let's not just mention the fact that their homicide rate of 35 uh, per 100,000 is well above the peak of the 1300s that he was using to bash the Middle Ages over the head with earlier on. Or the fact that the homicide rate was clearly much higher in the ANC South Africa than it was in apartheid South Africa back in the 1970s. Uh, these figures are pretty difficult to come by, but with enough sleuthing, you'll be able to find them. Um, note that the murder rate goes up even as GDP goes up in South Africa. Pinker makes no attempt to tackle such questions whatsoever. Because they don't fit in with the cheery progressive narrative he's trying to push all the way through this book. All of which is to say, the progressive Whig version of history strikes me as being based on some pretty shaky premises that involve a statistical trickery, outright lying about aspects of the past, smearing uh, ideological opponents, sidestepping difficult questions. And for all of these reasons, I'd encourage you to treat a man like Steven Pinker with the utmost distrust and to start questioning the Whig version of history in your own mind if you still hold dear to it. The truth is, as we saw from the example of Puritan New England, that social order doesn't just come about by itself. Sometimes you need the whip and the sword in order to make it happen. You will achieve an extremely low crime rate, a very low homicide rate. But the flip side is that you won't be living in a particularly liberal order. It strikes me that Pinker's thesis that the more liberal society gets, the less violent it gets, is clearly contradicted by facts he presents in the book himself. In fact, there are times when Pinker is so delusional in this book that that one has to question either his sanity or his honesty. All right, uh, would I recommend checking it out? No, your time is far better spent reading other books. If you must read a book uh, about uh, these sorts of issues. Uh, the Randolph Roth one, American Homicide, is a much better treatment. And in the case of uh, British crime, I will never uh, not plug Peter Hitchens's A Brief History of Crime, which will give you uh, a much more honest account of uh, the history of crime in England than Pinker. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments. As ever, I read all of your thoughts and I'll leave it there. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years, from the time of Aristotle through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out. If you like Academic Agent's content on this channel, sign up for a course on the Academic Agency. He's now offering Foundations of Economics. Click the link in the show description and level up your econ knowledge. Hello everyone and welcome to the sixth uh, video in this little series I am doing outlining issues with libertarianism. For this I would like to highlight this article that I saw on the Foundation for Economic Education website FEE. It's by Kimberly Josephson and it is called Five Reasons Americans Wrongly See Big Business as the Villain. Our lives have only gotten better as a result of capitalism and the ability to scale, she says. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, read this article or most of this article in its entirety. And then I'm going to bring you my new innovation, AA's Blackboard. 
Um, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to outline some of the reasons why it's not as simple as saying capitalism, good, big business, good, in the way that Kimberly Josephson is trying to do uh, here, at least not in 2021 with all that we've seen. So let us, uh, let us make a start. This is Josephson. She says, we all aspire for some form of achievement and usually applaud those when it is first obtained. Most recently, the new wolf on Wall Street, Whitney Wolf Herd, has been heralded in the media as the female CEO making history and a person to aspire to. But entrepreneurs beware. If you do too well for too long, perceptions of your wealth will likely shift as our culture tends to position wealth creators as greed mongers. However, it is our greed, not the entrepreneurs, that rewards them with riches. We willingly hand our dollars over for Teslas, iPhones and Prime deliveries that fulfill all types of needs and desires. I mean, I'll just pause here. Uh, again, I would question whether uh, consumer preferences are really what has driven the wealth of Elon Musk, uh, for example. Uh, it's true that uh, Amazon and Apple uh, have got popular uh, consumer devices but in the case of tesla I, I i wonder how much of that is driven by wall street rather than by uh by the average punter on the street anyway let, let's continue as such we should be thanking businesses for the options they have provided not giving producers guilt trips for the voluntary exchanges that they have enabled so i mean just before we go on i mean if all Apple did was make iPhones, or if all Amazon did was sell products at a competitive market rate, I don't think anybody would be objecting, but they don't. They go more than they, they go a step further, don't they? They try to push a vision of the world onto everyone else, and they uh, increasingly get bolshy with their demands for how the world should look. So uh, she's leaving out. Uh, a key part of why so many people have turned against uh, big business. It's not just because people think that Tim Cook or Mark uh, Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos are greedy. It's because they are increasingly behaving like tyrants. So anyway, let's continue. So here are some contradictory reasons why we shun those who have profited the most from their success and why we should change the negative narrative. One, she says... We like the underdog, but not the fat cat. We often celebrate and praise local businesses with shop small slogans, but if that small shop happens to develop into a franchise or to attract big investors, our perceptions seem to change. Think of all those bands we label as sellouts for, well, making sales. The presence of sustainable profits shouldn't negate all the hard ground work it took for that entrepreneur to get things going from unfortunate circumstances such as John Paul Mitchell's, Mitchell's rank to riches to endless trials to get the product right such as James Dyson's 1,127 prototypes for the first bagless vacuum. Any large business was once the small shop and its growth is a testament that it did something right. Yes, uh, Josephson, correct but what this is ignoring is the transition i have talked about from the entrepreneurial business driven by somebody with drive and vision and passion let's say for cars uh, in the case of henry ford or for uh, cartoons uh, in the and for theme parks in the case of walt disney or uh, you know, vacuum cleaners in the case of James Dyson or any other entrepreneur you care to name. Uh, and the transition that those uh, businesses take from being private businesses to um, IPOs that are then uh, that then become public companies uh, on the stock market um, when the entrepreneur dies and when the company is taken over by managerial elites. Um, I mean, she used the example of the iPhone. The visionary, 
Steve Jobs is, uh, you know, he's dead and gone. It is now being taken over by a professional manager, Tim Cook, who is unmistakably a member of the managerial elite. Uh, the same thing happened with uh, Google, famously, when um, uh, Sergey Brin and uh, Larry Page gave way to the likes of Eric Schmidt and Susan Wojcicki. Uh, and the same thing happened, I mean... We could talk about uh, the likes of Michael Eisner and uh, various other executives who've come into, uh, you know, Disney. It's a long way from the vision of Walt uh, Disney at this point. Um, and we can, I mean, you could pick any company you want and they go through that, uh, they go through that uh, process. So it's a little bit disingenuous to always go back to the rags to riches story because what happens to a company after the original entrepreneur is dead and gone or retires and the company is given over to the professional management class, that vision and drive and sense of family values and so on and hard work, uh, they often and uh, frequently get pushed uh, aside in favor of uh, kind of corporate values, whatever they happen to uh, to be, and increasingly, of course, in 2021, uh, that comes packaged with a, with a woke with a woke agenda, doesn't it? So, it's not um, enough just to appeal to the rags to riches story of the entrepreneur. So, you know, I give uh, Josephson naught out of ten here because she's not dealing with uh, the chief problem that people have. People don't resent or have a problem with the successful entrepreneur what they have a problem with is uh, companies who uh, go far beyond their original remit just just sh shut up brand and sell me cars or sell me chocolate bars or whatever happens to be don't try to uh, push anything else on me your politics for example um, Josephson just d d ignores that point so uh, yes l let us move on uh, number two, uh, we fail to realize that big businesses can be good for small businesses. During the 2021 Super Bowl, DoorDash tugged at our heartstrings while Uber Eats took a direct approach in calling for the support of local restaurants. And although these ads are self-surfing, that's okay. Our local support fuels their big businesses and vice versa. In fact, many small businesses source from and leverage large corporations, and as such, small firms can have a powerful influence on the larger players. Can they now? Can they? Well, let's see. Let, let's pretend that all of the uh, small uh, and medium firms that source a massive corporation like General Motors or Ford or Coca-Cola or Pepsi or Unilever, uh, you know, let's pretend they all decided to get together and say, well, look, we've had enough of this uh, woke agenda you're trying to push on us, uh, massive corporation, and we're going to withhold our business from you until, uh, you know, you stop doing this. Do you, th do you think they'd listen? Or do you think they just simply reroute and find new suppliers? Um, so it's a little bit disingenuous to say um, that uh, they have a powerful influence on the larger players. Um, also, this uh, this overlooks uh, a lot of the uh, pressures that come the other way. You know, I, I've I've looked on this channel uh, before at the relationship between some of the large supermarkets in this country and the farmers, uh, Tesco's and Sainsbury's, for example, t Tesco's especially. Are, are very are famous for leveraging their their massive economies of scale um often the only purchaser for various farms they essentially have many of these small suppliers over a barrel and get to set their price so when tesco's want to uh, reduce uh you know the uh price of items on the shelf they lean on their suppliers to reduce the wholesale uh, price. And many times, the small supplier has no negotiation power. So it, it's, um, it, it, I think it's disingenuous to ignore these things in, the, in this article from, uh, from Fee. Uh, she says, the wonderful thing about a market economy is the derived demand it generates and the supporting industries it can invigorate. Many small towns house big businesses and Forbes' list of America's best largest employers features several firms with small town roots. 
providing employment opportunities that can lead to individual advancement. I mean, notice the sleight of hand that happened there, where she said uh, many of the biggest firms started out, you know, they had small town roots. Uh, what does that mean to any of those small towns that uh, that are still there? I mean, oh, yeah, great. The original McDonald's was here. Who cares? Um, so I don't uh, I don't think that this is a particularly good argument. The, the first paragraph and the second paragraph do not address um, any of the major issues that anybody from a small business would have. I mean, it, it, she wrote this article in um, four days ago, March of 20th, 20, 2021. What's the number one gripe that a small business would have with a big business in 2021? It's the fact that the government shut down the small business while keeping the big businesses open propping up the big business, leaning on the small business and shutting them down for the lockdown, uh, both in Britain and in uh, vast swathes of America, especially the, those uh, areas with Democrat governors. Um, so, yes, she didn't mention that. She didn't mention the enormous lobbying power that big business has that small businesses do not. So... Um, yeah, again, I'm giving this article a naught out of 10 so far. And, and and don't forget, I'm somebody with free market sensibilities and leanings. You know, I, I'm uh, uh, into Austri Austrian economics. Um, and yet, I come across this article and I'm thinking, I don't want to be on the same side as this woman. Um, so anyway, let, let, let's carry on. Number three, Hollywood distorts reality while raking in riches. The villainizing of venture capitalists is, com is a common practice in films and TV series, with billionaire Batman as an exception. The media portrays CEOs as being abhorrent and corrupted by their money, but this seems rather paradoxical given that these tycoon tyrants are played by millionaire and billionaire actors who have traditionally gone unscathed for their wealth, despite their uh, more than questionable moral standards. Okay, well... I'm with you there. Let's question the moral standards of Hollywood. Uh, good that she's picked up on this. But this is just whataboutism, isn't it? It's, 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 not, um, it's, uh, it's not really addressing any, any serious point that any, anyone would have with big business in 2021. It's just kind of going for a, you know, a bit of low-hanging fruit elsewhere. So, again, a naught out of ten argument here. Look, who cares? How, Hollywood lie about everything. Of course they're going to lie about venture capitalists as well. Who, I mean, who, who gives a shit? Um, unlike how it is portrayed in the movies, the market is not a zero-sum gain, and the rich don't profit from people being poor. Actually, many who are rich give back quite a lot. And now, I don't know what's uh, through that link, and I'm not going to... Uh, click on it here but um that's something else that people really need to question i mentioned henry ford uh, earlier on now uh he set up something called the henry ford foundation or he left uh, left a bunch of money i'm not sure how the ford foundation got going um but this is the idea of the rich giving back i mean let's have a look what sort of activities the ford foundation fund or um any of the other large chair i mean let's look at uh, bill gates and what you know what charitable what charities what non-government organization organizations uh under the guise of charity is he funding how much of that money ends up in the open open society uh you know ngo uh list for example how much of it goes to agitating um you know against a foreign governments abroad in the name of this that or the other how much of it goes to uh, you know um pro choice groups how much of it goes to the democrat party or or to the republicans for that matter you know how, how much of this uh you know giving back quite a lot how much of it is genuine charity and how much of it is activism in the name of charity and again if Joseph Sum was honest and if she was writing a genuine article, she tried to address some of these points, some of these serious pro problems that people have with big business in 2021. Let us continue. This is a terrible uh, advertisement for Fee, uh, you know, one of the venerable old uh, libertarian uh, think tanks and organizations out there. You know, many, many good books and articles over the years. But uh, this is the sort of thing they're putting out at the moment. Uh, you know, is this going to resonate with anyone, anyone at all who's been paying attention? 
Uh, four, we think big businesses can't be beat. Suppose monopolies don't last long in a competitive market, given that entrepreneurs play offence, resulting in industry leaders being constantly challenged. Michael Porter attests that substitutions are ever-present but easy to overlook since it differs from the industry's leading offering. But eventually new entrants will steal the spotlight, much like how esports is attracting players and investors at an impressive rate and is uh, predicted to support surpass traditional sports. Many of the top firms of yesteryear are only namesakes today and at present invites to, to Clubhouse are making Facebook notifications look quite dated. Disruptions can and do happen if entry costs and regulations are manageable. Entrepreneurs leverage indirect forms of competition and launch not only innovations, but substitutions. Kodak is still trying to make a comeback from f phones replacing cameras. Now, again, I understand this argument. I've made this argument myself in the past. But it doesn't address... The, the root of the issue with the monopolies themselves why is it okay that when i tried to boycott p and g after their uh you know horrendous gillette ad that i found it virtually impossible because the the top three brands in that category are all owned by p and g Wh why is it that general motors has gone bust four times and yet is still in operation you know how, how how do all these companies keep on going it's because they are backed by the state aren't they kimberly you, you've left that fact out you've left out the uh you know very cozy relationship that the facebook's and the apples have with the current government in america You've left out the extremely cozy relationship that those automobile manufacturers have had with the government going back to the 1930s. It's disingenuous to leave out that detail uh, because it's part of the root cause of why these monopolies exist. They're not necessarily uh, what they would call efficiency monopolies, are they? They're, they're state-backed, state-induced uh, uh, monopolies. And so... Even the natural uh, disruptive power of the market and the, in the innovation that comes in, uh, it, you know, they're able to keep it at bay through backing various bits of uh, regulation, which I'll, which I'll get onto in a second. It's interesting to look at their incentives for supporting regulation, and we'll, we'll get into that when I get to the blackboard. Number five, concentrated wealth and power makes us uncomfortable. I mean, it's not just uncomfortable, it's not just uncomfortable, is it? It's, it's not just making us uncomfortable. It's affecting us because they're trying to destroy our culture. It's not, it's not just uncomfortable. It's an existential threat to everything we've known. But, she says, in due time, even the biggest firms can become vulnerable or go bust in a free market economy. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's theoretic. But the, the fact that Blockbuster exists... OK, or the fact that, um, you know, you can point to any major company in the past that's now, you know, either gone out of business or they're no longer a market player. You know, you can point to AOL or, you know, some what, what, pick your any example, A&P, whatever it happens to be. OK, but Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Unilever, Facebook, Apple, Google aren't all going to go bust, are they? Ford, General Motors, uh, you know, you go down, the, the entire Fortune uh, 500 is not going to go bust. One or two of those companies may go, but not all of them. And when they're all singing from the same hymn sheet and, and affecting our culture on the level that they are, this argument's not going to get anywhere. You know, when they're when they're all on the same side, it becomes a problem, especially when they use monopolistic uh, tactics uh, to keep out new competitors. You know, when when my pillow is uh, you know is is getting their uh, card processing capabilities pulled from them, when new entrants to the market are being kept out of the market through. Um, you know, cartel-like behavior when Gab uh, is trying to 
um, you know, provide an alternative platform to Twitter and he's had five bank accounts shut. This is not the market in operation, is it, Kimberly? But you're not addressing any of those things, which are at the root of why so many people reading this article are turning against big business. So th these arguments are landing on deaf ears, aren't they? Because they're not addressing what's actually been going on in the world for the past 5, 10, 20 years. Although the reins on some public sectors are loosening, such as NASA welcoming competition, others are tightening or showing no signs of ever shifting. Think back to F.A. Hayek's criticism of the monopolization of money. If we are concerned with a firm being in control of too much of a market offering, we should be more concerned of the concentration of power wielding control over entire industries. But even the public sector can't stop private competition from providing alternatives from cryptocurrencies challenging fiat dollars to next day deliveries speeding past the USPs. Yes, but what I'm saying is that needs to happen across the board and it's not going to, is it? I mean, just, just saying, I mean, we're at the point where these companies are so big that they can make decisions that piss off half of their customer base and it just doesn't even matter to them. They can make a loss and it just doesn't matter. Most of them do turn a, lot, a loss because they're answerable ultimately to shareholders and Wall Street does its own thing. It has a different set of metrics and indicators that it looks at. So it's not even about whether the man on the street is buying the product or not. Some of these, some of these biggest companies we've we, we've heard of are, you know, valued at billions of billions of dollars who've never turned a profit. Anyway, let's let's carry on. Our lives have only benefited from capitalism and those who harness the power of profit, given the ability to scale. Profits can help support and grow an organization, and serve as a buffer when times get tough. This is why many non-profits are struggling to sustain themselves given hardships caused by COVID-19 and why the change for shared value is gaining traction since business solutions can serve as social solutions if meeting a need while making a profit. Well, I mean, you assume they make a profit. It's not always the case. Ludwig von Mises noted that there is no Western capitalistic country in which the conditions of the masses have not improved in an unprecedented way. And this is because entrepreneurs pivot according to economic contingencies. So let them pivot and let us praise them for it and profit from it. Within the US, each generation has fed better than the last thanks to technological advancements. So I'll just pause again uh, before I get to my uh, blackboard. How many people watching this video are in their 30s or in their 20s or even even in their late teens, okay? And I've seen the demographics of this channel and most of the viewers uh, are younger than 35 uh, and a huge bunk of, bulk of viewers are in their 20s. I ask you, do you feel that you are better off than previous generations? You, you let me know in the in the show notes if you genuinely feel that you're better off than your parents and your grandparents were? Do you feel like you live in a materially better off society, in a safer society, in a society that, you know, feels like uh, it has a hopeful future? Tell me, tell me that, because when Ludwig von Mises noted that back in, 19, back in 1949 when he was writing, it was true, absolutely true. But... This is 70 years since then. Is it still true now? Well, you tell me. You, you have the experience of being a young person at this time. They've got access to better ideas and resources. Better ideas? Really, Kimberly? Ideas like what? Ideas like white people are at the root of all evil? Ideas like, um, you know, there's no real distinction between the genders and that 
you know, a man can be a woman and a woman can be a man, no problem. Better ideas like that? Which better ideas do you have in mind? And despite unforeseen hardships and externalities, the profit motive has promoted progress in an unimaginable way. Progress, yeah. And talent continues to emerge. And such talent should serve as an inspiration and nothing less. And that's how she ends the article. So Buy Foundations of Writing on the Academic Agency. To write clearly will help you to think clearly. The ability to communicate ideas in lucid prose is foundational to success in many areas, and it is a basic requirement in every walk of life. You will learn the parts of speech and come to understand the core functions of the English language, sentence construction and syntax, punctuation, style, and common mistakes. Once you see how mistakes are made, you will not unsee them. You will know for the rest of your life. Foundations of Writing. Buy it now. So, hopefully you can see some of the problems with this already. But let me, uh, let me begin my uh, Blackboard breakdown. So what I've uh, done here on the Blackboard is uh, I've, um, I've made three columns. What libertarians want, what big businesses want, and what government wants, okay? And this is why I have titled this video, Are Libertarians the Useful Idiots of Big Business? Okay? Libertarians want deregulation. Big business, on the other hand, actually welcome regulations because they are the ones who have vast compliance uh, departments, people actually whose interest and job it is to welcome in and implement new regulations. Okay, They also have the resources and the reserves to be able to make the capital investments um, to meet the new regulatory barrier. So regulations are very good for big business because they actually help to uh, pull the ladder up. They help to make it harder for new entrants to the market. Um, so big business will always welcome regulations. I mean, take the situation with the, the social media now. Let's imagine that Congress bring in a whole new raft of uh, regulations. Google and Facebook um, and uh, uh, Twitter... They, they probably have the financial backing and the reserves to be able to deal with whatever new regulations are brought in. Could Gab comply with them? You know, does the does the chap running running that with his uh, you know, tiny staff have the res have the capability to deal with whatever Congress throw at him? Especially given that those regulations are probably going to be co-written by his competitors. I mean, that's just one that's just one market, but you know, one industry, uh, but that's how it is across the board. You know, all of, all of these lobby groups, they um, they welcome the regulations because they, they're they invited to sit on con consultation meetings and they end up writing them. So obviously government won't want to regulate more, big business wants to regulate more, so government and big business have aligned incentives. Uh, and libertarians, well, they want deregulation and they don't, they don't get that except in an area which I'm about to get to in a second. Libertarians are against cronyism. That's big business and government working together. But big business, they give donations to lobby government. And the government are answerable to those donors. So, and they like the money that they get from those donors. And uh, big business get more of a say in what goes on, you know, the more of those do donations they give. And they get special favours from, from the government. So... I mean, it's all well and good, libertarians being against cronyism, but they never, st they, you know, they're never going to get their way on that one. So big business doesn't care what libertarians say, and neither does the government. So they can argue against cronyism all day long. It still happens. Third, libertarians want a smaller state. Well, big business wants a bigger state, because the bigger the state, you know, don't forget, the state always gives big, big business a leg up. You know, not only are they donors, but they're also massive employers most of the time. And so there's an incentive for any government because they want to look good on paper. You know, employment's gone up under me. Um, they've got a permanent incentive to try to, uh, you know, give a leg up to the big business whenever they can. So, of course, the big business supports a bigger state and the government supports a bigger state. Because the big, big business and the state are just two heads of the same beast. 
libertarians still haven't learned that lesson apparently four libertarians want lower taxes well big business wants lower taxes too but here's the counterintuitive point the government also wants lower taxes because it's they're popular and they can sell that you know when was the last time any western government tried to balance the books by you know trying to bring in more you know trying to raise taxes to bring in more money that way while um lowering spending they don't do that that they'll they'll increase spending and they'll lower taxes at the same time as trump did Um, you know, so, so the government does not always have an, the government has actually an incentive to lower taxes or at least to be seen to lower taxes. Um, so this is one where the libertarians are in line with what the big business and the government wants. And this is one of the areas where they can be, you know, useful idiots, uh, you know, and, uh, perhaps it's even popular. This is the one area where it's fairly popular with most people. Nobody wants to pay more taxes, right? Fifth. Libertarians support private property. Well, big business, they support private property to the extent that it gives them nominal independence for their own activities. You know, ideally, Mark Zuckerberg does not want any kind of third-party oversight of where he's sticking his money, does he? Of what activities he's funding, uh, how he's getting involved in, in, in local and national politics. Uh, and he's just one example. There are, you know, there are dozens of these billionaires getting involved all over the place, all through history, but especially in American history. So, yeah, big business supports private property too. But what big business means by private property is that, the sphere to be able to influence stuff without anybody looking over their shoulder. They're not just thinking of somebody owning their, owning their own house and painting their own fence and mowing their own garden. They're thinking of a lack of accountability for their interference in social and political affairs and their ability to hide their you know, assets in various uh, interesting and cunning ways. And the government, of course... Now, this is, this is also where I think... Um, a lot of libertarians are stuck in a kind of old-fashioned paradigm where they imagine the state and the government want to increase, want to increase their powers, right, to to nationalise things or to bring more things in the direct control of the state. That's not the case, and uh, I'll explain why in a moment. The government actually wants to get key functions off the books and into the hands of big business. The more key stuff they can get into the hands of big business, the less accountable the government are for it. You see, and I, I'll talk about I'll talk about that in a moment. And let's just finish off the list. Finally, libertarians support personal freedom, whereas big business, of course, they support the woke agenda, which is a kind of personal freedom. You know, it's the freedom to have a the freedom to have a sex change, the freedom to have an abortion. The freedom to, uh, the freedom to, uh, you know, take take part in a gay gay pride, uh, the the freedom to uh, teach critical race theory, etc., etc., etc. It's a, it's a ty- it's a type of freedom um, that they are pushing. Not necessarily the kind of negative liberty that the libertarians are pushing for. Um, but it's still predicated on, on, on a kind of personal freedom. The freedom to smoke weed, for example, would be something that all of these guys would agree with. The freedom to watch porn. The freedom to do all of those kind of de- degenerate things that you're used to doing. And, of course, big business supports all of those things. Because, uh, you know, it, it makes a more compliant customer base, doesn't it? The more of these vices you can get people addicted to the more money you can extract from them uh, to do various things. And then, uh, of course, the the government support the woke agenda. Uh, And when I say the government, it doesn't matter if it's Tory or Labour or Republican or or Democrat. They all support 
all of this rubbish. The only part of the American uh, system that doesn't are the ones who are still being, you know, loyal to the former, to the 45th president. president. But, um, you know, there's still a battle for control over the, the GOP there. And uh, the instincts of a lot of the old kind of Bush era guys is actually when when push comes to shove, they're with the wokesters and against the against the populists. We've seen that. You've seen Mitt Romney march with BLM. You've seen uh, Mitch McConnell, you know, prostrate himself in front of Harris and Biden, etc. So. If you have a think about what is what is it that libertarians actually get, what is it that they ever achieve to the extent they achieve anything at all, uh, they never get any of the first three things, right? They never get the smaller state, they never get a decrease in cronyism, and they never really get the, de- the, the full suite of deregulation they want. They only ever achieve this, what I've circled here. Libertarians only ever get wins in this zone. Okay, lower taxes, maintenance of private property for massive corporations. Note, inc- increasingly, the private property of the citizen doesn't really matter. Um, we're seeing a, an unprecedented attack on, uh, you know, the private sphere of the individual in the pandemic in both Britain and America. In both Britain and America. I mean, uh, in Britain yesterday, um, or was it earlier today? Uh, the mayoral candidate, Lawrence Fox, uh, had a policeman knock at, knock, knock at his front door, breaking COVID restrictions with his campaigning materials. You know, you've got the police, you know, knocking on the door on, you know, on behalf of the current mayor to one of his, to one of his political rivals. That is private property that the police knocked on his door. In America, you will see increasing attacks on the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms. So, and, and you, you're also seeing an attack on private property on in the individual sphere by big business itself. Uh, think of the whole subscription model thing. I mean, I can just tell you, uh, just tell you an anecdotal uh, one that, that happened to me the other day. I got one of these Amazon Music accounts um, where I've programmed. I don't really use it myself, but I've got uh, nursery rhymes program for for AAA on there, and I, t- I took I took hours to uh, so, you know I've made eight different playlists along different themes, and um, I started one up, and uh, one of them starts with uh, the song Animal Fair. I went to the Animal Fair. The birds and the bees are there, and. Um, didn't didn't come on skipped that and i went on to am like, what happened to that gone disappeared from amazon unlimited music whatever it's called just gone so there's an example of where well i didn't really own that song i thought i mean i got used to having it but at the capricious whim of the vendor it was taken away from me and i really brought home that if you're relying on any of these, I mean, I don't rely it for my own music. I've got my own uh, downloads and my old CDs and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, if I was relying on that, well, now my favorite song is gone. And sooner or later, Amazon decide, well, yeah, this old, this old, uh, this old song from the 1970s is problematic. Needs to be, uh, needs to be censored. I mean, Disney did it the other day. They, they, they took down Dumbo. They, they, they literally took Dumbo off their list of um, classic films on, on their Disney Plus channel. So now if you're a Disney Plus uh, subscriber, you thought you were getting the entire Disney ca- catalog. Now one of the major films, Dumbo, last I checked, is unavailable because it contains r- offensive racial stereotypes. So anyway... Um, private property in the individual sphere is under attack but when it comes to the big corporates it's massively defended and you saw this defense used a lot when twitter banned donald trump all of the lefties came out and said well it's private property 
he can do what he wants in his private property. Finally, uh, yes, uh, personal freedom, yeah, and uh, and of course, um, in this sphere, you know, if, if libertarians want to uh, campaign for weed or porn or the right to, or, you know, the right to lower the age of consent or any of these other sorts of things, they'll get their way. But they'll win victories in that sphere, and it will make people like the British are happy. So. Yeah, let us continue. Why does government want to put key functions into the hands of big business? Well, first of all, because it maintains regulatory oversight of big business without any of the headaches of organization or any of the costs. It's actually fantastic for the government to get something that they were formerly responsible for off the books. Uh, you saw it in this country, like they were so relieved to get rid of like the post office and Royal Mail and British Rail and British Gas and all of these kind of lumbering, you know, relics of the 1970s. Um, you know, when they were privatized, they were happy to, to, to let private hands, you know, take that over. If anything goes wrong, of course, the government can shift and blame the greedy businesses. And also localize the evil um, in particular people or organizations. Oh, it was this business. It was this CEO. It was this particular person who did it. It wasn't our fault, Gov. It was, it was them. So it's fantastic. They, they, they maintain oversight, but they don't have to deal with any of the kind of day-to-day, -day, you know, um, difficulties that go along with it. And, of course, it ensures the long-term survival of key donor classes. Um, you know, if, if we take the example of the rail of the rail situation, in order to operate on those lane, on those rail lines, they need to win a contract from the government. You know, state backed. It's a, basically a state backed monopoly, but you win the right to run the line. Well, if Richard Branson wanna, wants to run his Virgin train down there, you know, maybe the Labour Party or the Tory Party might might like a little backhander from Richard Branson for them for the right to do so. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's a no-brainer. And I, for me, I think this is the key lesson of the, uh, that the state or the government, uh, I mean, the state and the government aren't, too, aren't the same thing, but I think the, the operators in and around government kind of learned this from the, the Reagan years and the Thatcher years, and it was perfected under Clinton, uh, George Bush, and Tony Blair, uh, what what we now call neo neo liberalism, um, it, you know they were able, they were new labor in this country privatized so many things, but they didn't kind of they didn't privatize it by um, you know laying it open to the whims of the market. They did it in this way where it's like well it's heavily regulated, it's a government contract. Um, but rather than us deal with a headache, we're going to pay this hospital to do it instead. Or, you know, in America, you get the private prisons. You know, rather than the, rather than the state run this prison, we'll um, contract it out. So this is, this is how they, they manage to kind of outsource functions of the state to private businesses uh, without truly losing control over it, if that makes any sense. Um, and this is, uh, this is really how this almost like fascist neo neoliberal state has has emerged through these through these uh kind of uh i mean a, a very good example actually is peter peter Thiel's company if you, if you want to look into that look into how peter Thiel makes his money you know he's a big defense contractor his only client is really the u.s government how many firms look, or look at the relationship between the governments now and all the big pharmaceuticals Big Pharma is in bed with the government. And obviously the pandemic has made that obvious. So, uh, yeah, it, again, it's superficially different entity. And it means it's technically not on the government government's books. But ultimately, this is the same class of people. Just across, you know, just technically on paper. It's not part of the state. So it's kind of clever. It's kind of clever move that they've uh, they've done hope people can see it 
Why would big business want to take on these government functions? I'll outline some more reasons. Number one, they gain power without accountability. So we saw the government's reasons. These are big businesses' reasons now. They gain power without accountability. And number two, hugely increased influence in the direction of life um, uh, for privileged minorities to push their political and social agendas. Massively more influential now. They'll call it something like, oh, well, let's have a consultation. Let's have a consultation with uh, this business or that business and we'll go through the guidelines. But then they, then they implement it. I mean, how often have you seen um, YouTube or Facebook or Twitter act as a proxy for the government in the past year? And when I say the government, I don't mean... I don't mean uh, you know the former president. I mean all all of the all the rest of the parts of the state, or in, or in the British case, I mean uh, just the government. They're in lockstep with the government, hundred percent of the way on all issues. So the, the idea there's a distinction between these, you know, the big business and the and the government is nonsensical to me in 2021. It's just a kind of outsourced facility. And again, I think the pandemic makes it makes it obvious how quickly, look how quickly the supermarkets got all of their mask paraphernalia up and running, the little arrows on the floor, all of the government mandated stickers. Of course, they can they can do it quickly because it's almost like a kind of they're so big that they might as well be. They might as well be another wing of the government at this point. And functionally, I would argue they are. Technically, they're not on the books. Third, they can work successively to disenfranchise the majority group. And um, that, of course, is the woke agenda. But, and also this other thing I was talking about, you know, you will own nothing and you will like it. The, the perpetual rent model that they're trying to push in, in many different spheres of life now. Both of these things. So, yeah, lots of advantages for, for, for big business. As long as liberal democracy persists as our system, oligarchs will rule because, number one, if merchants are not held in check by warriors and priests, they can use their resources to persuade and to trick the masses into serving their interests to their own detriment and even eventual destruction. And I mean the the eventual de destruction and detriment of, of the majority population of the masses. Okay. Um, but liberal democracy is a system of mass persuasion. Well, who's good at mass persuasion? It's... You know, companies with massive PR wings and advertising budgets and marketing campaigns. They've got the ways and the means to do it. They alone have the resources and the powers of persuasion necessary to sway the mass man. And if you doubt that, if you doubt that they have this power, have a look next time you're out how many people are wearing masks out in the street have a look how many people if you're here in britain have got we love the nhs stickers in their in their front window let alone looking at the sales of all of the top brands so yes it's a persuasion game when it comes to liberal democracy and what that actually does it doesn't it doesn't give power to the mass man it concentrates power into those who have the resources to sway the mass man that, that is the tr that is why liberal democracy is favored by the merchants because they can use all of their powers and tricks and their resources to get one over on all of the other all of the other power classes And it's very successful. 
if you doubt it, I mean, just just look at how many people still support NFL games and you name it. Just look how many people go on LinkedIn, right? Here, here's here's my challenge to you, right? If if you work in a kind of corporate career, just, just have a little look on LinkedIn and uh, read some of the absolute rubbish that uh, people post on their LinkedIn profiles in 2021. People do comply with the social pressure that's put on them, even if the ideas are totally absurd and even if the ideas lead directly to the destruction of everything you love. Whatever the theoretical wishes of libertarianism, its practical political effects are to empower the merchant class. At root, the question you must ask yourself is this. Whether the state of affairs in which we are ruled over by the merchant class is preferable to rule by any of the other classes, okay? So what's the, what's the alternatives? I've laid out the problems and we're all know, we all know about these problems. What are the alternatives? Well, we could be ruled over by the priest class, by the warrior class, whatever that means in 2021, but, you know, the military, uh, the class of the mass man, the class of outcasts, or just a foreign power. Just, just accept the foreign power comes and invades. That's another kind of uh, possibility, right? Um, and, um, well, I mean, if we have a little assessment, there are no alternatives to this other than in utopian dreams. So you may be thinking, well, why does it have to be one of these? Why can't it be something else? I'm an ANCAP. I, you know, I dream of the end of the state. Not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. It's a utopian dream. It, it's as unlikely to happen as the communist, as the communist utopia that um, bottom left uh, uh, p people dream about where everybody's an artist and nobody's starving <clears throat> not going to happen and even if it did happen right even if you some somehow brought about the ancap utopia you'd still be ruled over by <laughs> there would still be hierarchy there and it would probably be the car king that i've talked about before so you'd still be ruled over by a type of merchant in, in, in that society there is no escaping it. There has to be a group on top. The question is which group and what benefits and drawbacks do each bring? That is the question that you should be asking in your kind of theoretical way of thinking at the moment, I think. That's the real that's the realistic assessment, because it's not gonna be it's not gonna be any of these kind of utopian ones. Number one, the current merchant class is allied both to the class of the outcasts and to foreign interests. And that is obvious, if you think about it. The the class of outcasts, which is the intersectional coalition, right? The uh, LGBT, um, immigrants, people of colour, Muslims, you know. This is the class of outcasts. This, these are the kind of people who... Uh, a generation ago, were on the fringes of society. They were kind of un you know unwanted and mocked, um, uh, repressed, you could say, or op oppressed, as they argue. Um, but now, you know, now's their time. They're 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 being liberated by the uh, by the merchant class. So that's the you know, and they use they use those as a battering ram against uh, against their enemies uh, as we've seen okay they obviously don't have the interests of those people at heart but they they use them i mean i'm talking about the outcasts here uh, which particular foreign interests they're in hock to uh, you know you can speculate amongst yourselves um this means that in effect most of the west is ruled by a cabal of its enemies uh, i mean i i would i would argue that uh, we have seen that most of most of Western civilization is ruled over by people who are ac actively hostile to it and want to destroy it. Uh, hence, a cabal of its enemies. 
That is a situation that we face. And that is the situation that has developed with the merchants in charge. Okay. Libertarian think tanks such as uh, Fee still seem to argue as if it is 1950 rather than 2021. It's like they're stuck in this time warp where they're still arguing with John Maynard Keynes back in 1949. very different time many different developments since 1950 it is not this is not to say that the, that the free market principles uh on a theoretical level that the likes of Mises talked about are not true w what i'm saying is is that the reality on the ground and the facts and the events that have happened mean there are there are more pressing concerns right now with whether we are championing uh, this entrepreneur or that entrepreneur because certain entrepreneurs are basically trying to ruin ruin everything that we love and we have to ask why we have to come to get to the this is a going to be the challenge of all of our lifetimes and it's not being helped by articles like this from fee this makes them worse than useless in the current year it makes them an active part of the ruling regime you know, to me, this article marked Kimberly out not as an ally. She doesn't seem like a friend to me. She seemed like she was on the side of the enemy. I mean, tell me if you're wrong. Maybe, maybe you're watching this and you're a libertarian and you, and you you think, well, Kimberly, she sounds more like you know the person on my side. And if you feel that, tell me in the tell me in the notes. Tell me why you disagree with 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 what I've been saying and why you side with her. To me, doesn't seem like she's a friend. Tell me if you think she's a friend. To support big business in 2021 is to support the destruction of your culture and history. It is to support an insane radical agenda hell-bent on destroying Western civilization. And when I say support, I don't actually mean in terms of money, right? Because there's no... It's very difficult, like I said, to boycott all of I mean, if you boycotted every single big business, you couldn't live. OK, um, you know, they're so ubiquitous that uh, it's virtually impossible to. It, I mean, if you tried to cut out Unilever and P&G, just just those two companies, the amount of your the amount of products that simply disappear th th that have no alternative is vast. If you added Pepsi, Coca-Cola and um, let's say um, Amazon, right, to to that, especially in lockdown conditions, how are you going to survive? So, you know, I, I would say there are real practical drawbacks to uh, the, the idea that you're going to, you know, you're going to financially squeeze them out. That's, that's very difficult. But what I'm talking about is supporting them intellectually, and apologizing for them and coming up with arguments in defense of them like what this kimberly is doing here that shouldn't be what libertarians are doing in 2021 i'm afraid they should be hammering these big businesses as being the enemies of the free market and the enemies of liberty that's what they should be doing but they're not there are no solutions only trade-offs famous thomas soul line the trade-off for worldly luxuries porn superhero films and all of the other things that you've enjoyed your whole life is the total destruction of your history and culture and the complete moral subversion of your societies i know i don't know if that is a necessary trade-off i don't know if that will always come if you allow the merchant class to rule i don't know if it's necessary but it is in our contingent reality in 2021 what has happened this is the evidence that we have from history that they have almost destroyed our culture okay it's got a long way to go yet there are you know it's far from being over in in britain or america or in europe our history is too long and there are too many people who who love it okay but the damage is massive and if something is not done within our lifetimes, it will be gone, friends. So this is the trade-off. So yes, 
you know, we all love our worldly luxuries. I'm as guilty as anyone. Nescafe gold, ha ha. But if it's a choice between all of that shit and the Western culture and, and its history and the preservation of all of those things, you have to ask yourself, well, what ultimately do you want? Is it the porn and the anime and the bloody weed? Or is it those other things that matter? I don't think it's a false dichotomy. I really don't at this point. Second, the trade-off for siding with warriors or the priest class against the merchants is, and this is a fact, a decline in material quality of life and possibly also of tech technology. It will, it, will, it will retard technological innovation, as we've seen in history, in the Chinese example and many other examples. Um, and it will also, um, you know, you'll, there will be things that you enjoy today that you, won't, that you wouldn't enjoy if you were, if you were ruled over by a, a military elite or by a, or, or by a priestly elite. That's just obvious. And you can even look at you can even look at other examples in in history. I mean, you know, th there is no doubt that the people of um, the people of Iran would be better off if they were not run by a group of clerics, in a material sense. Um, I mean, arguably spiritually too. But you know, that's a that's a that's a rather that's a separate issue that I I don't want to get into here. Um, but in theory, you know, uh, a theocracy could have benefits right could have benefits so again these are things that you have to that you have to think about and then third the trade off for siding with the mass man over the merchants is that it will likely transition society downwards even further or or as uh, as argued by plato and many others in history it would quickly dissolve into a petty tyranny and um i'm afraid to say all of those people um, who are on the Trump train, who are kind of populists. You, you know, I remember that, uh, was it the Democracy Party or whatever it was called, the Brexit Party? Um, yeah, it was the Brexit Party, wasn't it? Um, most of whom have ended up in the Lords now, I've noticed. Um, but that kind of populist energy would facilitate a transition from the merchant to the mass man and uh, it's not necessarily a move upwards right I, and the you know the world where the world where D donald trump crosses the rubicon for example isn't necessarily going to stop the you know what we call the acceleration isn't necessarily going to um lead an upwards direction is it not necessarily so, you know, there's some, something else to think about. And I, I think it's a question that populists need to need to think about because the populist position is the veneration of the mass man. If you're a populist, you have that in common with Brendan O'Neill, literally a kind of Marxist kind of character. Um, well, you know, what does it mean for the mass man to take over? Now, you could argue that the mass man is not just this one blob, but is made up of, you know, uh, uh, rural peasants, urban workers, artisans, um, or what you'd call like small business people these days, um, craftsmen, tradesmen, um, you know, and then all of the kind of minions of the state, the civil servants, the, you know, there are many different... Um, there are now most of those managers, most of those kind of managerial types, the civil servants, the teachers, the professors, and so on. Uh, they're in they're in the service, whether witting whether wittingly or not, of the merchant class. The managerial elite and the merchant class are kind of as one as things stand. Okay, um, so that there are careful distinctions you may want to make. I'm painting with the broadest uh, with the broadest brush here. But um, it is a question that any populist needs to ask themselves. What would a society led by the mass man look like? All right. So hopefully this video has given you uh, some food for thought. Um, 
I've just uh, left you with this uh, idea of pick your poison. I don't believe there are any any easy answers. I mean, it may well be that you that you know when all is said and done, you think about all of the relative costs and trade offs and pros and cons, and actually maybe rule by the merchants isn't so bad. In which case, go back to Fresh Prince, go back to your room, play with your toys and your costumes, and forget about all this. All right. Uh, so long for now. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years, from the time of Aristotle through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out. This video is more like a stray thought because I do not have settled conclusions on the problem I'm about to discuss yet. But I have been musing of late on the asymmetry between moral particularism and moral universalism. I am about to share with you some quotations from some ancient religious texts which demonstrate the issue quite well. Now, for the purposes of this video, it doesn't matter where these quotations are from, so I have substituted specific terms here with Carl Schmitt's terms, friend and enemy, which will still illustrate the basic problem. So let us begin the quotations. Only friends are human. Enemies are animals. For murder, whether of an enemy by an enemy or of a friend by an enemy, punishment is incurred. But of an enemy by a friend, there is no death penalty. Even the best of the enemies should be killed. If a friend is tempted to do evil, he should go to a city where he is not known and do the evil there. Enemy's flesh is as the flesh of asses and whose issue is like the issue of horses. If an enemy hits a friend, the enemy must be killed. Hitting a friend is hitting God. If an ox of a friend gores an ox of an enemy, there is no liability, but if an ox of an enemy gores an ox of a friend, the payment is to be in full. If a friend finds an object lost by an enemy, it does not have to be returned. God will not spare a friend who marries his daughter to an old man, or takes a wife for his infant son, or returns a lost article to an enemy. What a friend obtains by theft from an enemy, he may keep. Enemies are outside the protection of the law, and God has exposed their money to friends. Friends may use lies, subterfuges, to circumvent an enemy. All enemy children are animals. Enemies prefer sex with cows. The vessels of enemies... Do they not impart a worsened flavour to the food cooked in them? Now, for many of you watching this, all of these edicts would likely rankle with your moral intuition of fairness, and you might even find yourself instinctively siding with the enemy in all these sentences against what you perceive as evil. But if that is you, you're coming at the problem from a universalist perspective. And it is against all this that we can pit the universalist doctrine, which says, in any of its myriad forms, all humans, no matter their race, class or religion, should be subject to the same basic respect, subject to the same standards and the same laws, and that, as long as said laws are followed, they should not be restricted by artificial and man-made barriers. Perhaps the ultimate expression of this sort of sentiment is Karl Popper's The Open Society, 
of which George Soros is a famous adherent. Now I ask you, of these two worldviews, which one is more likely to win? Now, you may disagree, but it strikes me, looking at the course of history, that groups which have maintained a strong sense of moral particularism have thrived. You can provide your own examples. While groups which have become more and more open and egalitarian along the lines advocated by a popper or a Soros have suffered relative decline primarily because they have no defence against groups who have moral particularist attitudes once they are permitted to live in the open society. In any case, it is also quite likely that the open society in itself veils a particularist morality for its elites. I'm talking about current globalists, not necessarily Soros himself, but possibly. Nietzsche, in a sense, pointed to this issue when he talked about master and slave moralities. But it presents us with a genuine problem. If you entertain moral particularism, notions of right and wrong only really pertain to you and your in-group, with the enemy group demarked as an eternal other to whom such standards do not apply and cannot apply. In the final analysis, this can lead to the naked abuse of the other who comes to be viewed as less than fully human, as we saw in the quotations that I read out. If a moral standard does not apply universally and only applies to an in-group, can it truly be called moral? On the other hand, if you consider yourself a universalist, then on what basis can you reject the sort of open borders world envisioned by Popper or Soros? What is the moral basis of saying no to a refugee or an immigrant, legal or otherwise? Beyond that, if your universal standard is just ignored or actively flouted by outgroup members in any case, then is it really universal? Oswald Spengler argued that claims to universal standards in this way were always delusional, since distinct cultures cannot ever fully understand or assimilate into each other. So for Spengler, all morality, therefore, was of the particularist stripe. But even if we grant this, it still leads yet to further problems. Roger Scruton outlined three bases on which a group might root its friend-enemy distinction. We can call them the soil, the blood, and the creed. Let's suppose we settle on one of these. The issue of outsiders still does not go away if you settle on any one of them. If you base your group on the creed, that is, an ideas-based community, what is to stop infiltration from another group who simply pretend to believe your ideas but in actuality have a deeper bond either to the soil or the blood? We have seen false conversions for some nefarious reason or other many times in history. Some groups have used the idea of the creed as a disguise for what was in fact the blood and then oscillated between these two modes as and when it advantaged them. The soil, as a basis for the friend-enemy distinction, has largely the same issue, which is to say that there is little to stop an incoming group, an outgroup that is, from nominally pledging allegiance to the soil, but in fact having a stronger affinity to the blood or the creed. That leaves us with the blood itself, which does have the strength of the fact that that newcomers cannot really join it. But the weakness of the blood is the fact that nothing else but the blood really binds the group, which is to say, with blood and blood alone, the members of the group can radically disagree, and ideas and disagreements of this 
type can lead to schisms within the in-group, if nothing else binds them, but, uh, but their blood. So-called third positionists present themselves as a blood community, but in actuality, if you actually analyze them uh, in any real depth, you will quickly find that they are, in fact, a creed community. It strikes me that the only real secure basis for a friend-enemy distinction would be somehow to blend all three of these together, that is, the soil, the blood, and the creed, all together. But this in itself has severe practical difficulties in 2021, when the peoples of the earth are scattered all around it, some very far away from their homelands, some the product of different groups, some who think they belong to this blood or to that soil, but in actuality belong to neither. It will be very difficult to get back to something like the map of 1800 or 1700, uh, even with the best will in the world. Now, as I have said, I have no conclusions here. I just wanted to share a little of what I've been thinking about, but I will give you some questions to ponder. The first question is this. Are you a moral particularist or a universalist? Why? And how do you resolve the problems I have outlined in this video? Second, given the relative strengths and weaknesses of the soil, the blood and the creed, which I have outlined here, which one or combination of these would you go for and why? How do you overcome the difficulties inherent in each of them that I have presented. I'll look forward to reading your comments as ever. Many thanks. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years, from the time of Aristotle through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe, and if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out. In this video, I want to interrogate Anglo-American assumptions about individualism and meritocracy, which are supposedly fostered by the free market. I am going to imagine two groups, a minority special interest group and a much bigger majority group, which I will call the out group. This is for the purpose of thinking through the problem. These two groups are hypothetical only and do not bear any relation to any real world groups. If you find yourself imagining that these examples relate to real groups, then it is your own mind doing that and you'd have to ask yourself why it is doing it. So let us begin. Imagine these 100 circles are the members of a year group in a boys' school. So each circle is a young man. Three of these boys belong to a special group. Let's call them Ben, Sam, and David. In all other respects, Ben, Sam, and David look and talk like their classmates but they belong to a special group. Their parents all know each other, and so the key difference is in the messaging they receive at home. Ben, Sam and David are each told by their parents that they are part of a special group and are better than their classmates. This is reinforced on the weekend when they go to meet boys and girls from other schools that are also part of this special group. Meanwhile, all the other members of the class are told at home and at school that they are individuals who will succeed or fail based on their individual merits. Ben, Sam and David receive the same messaging at school, but in practice their parents ensure that they are given special treatment by pressuring the headmaster. We might see how belonging to this special group might advantage these three boys from an early age. Let us consider sport. The best in the year group is Billy, then Victor, 
Ben and David are in the next group down, and Sam is only mediocre. However, it just so happens that David's uncle is the manager of the sports team, and so, just like that, Ben, Sam and David are always picked for the team. Now, as they get older, we might see this effect multiply. Let's consider their grades. Top of the year is a boy called Jim, then John. Sam is quite bright, but he's not quite the brightest. And then David and Ben are lower down again. But then, when it comes to applying for places at law school, Jim and John both want to practice law, as do Sam and Ben. It just so happens that Ben's father is the head of the law faculty at an elite university. So when the applications go in, Jim and John are both rejected, while Sam and Ben secure places on the strength of Ben's father's recommendations. Jim and John both end up at a second-tier university. Meanwhile, Joe, David and Graham all want to become journalists, but it just so happens that Sam's father is the editor of a major newspaper. So naturally, David gets a work placement at this paper, while Joe and Graham have to start at minor local papers. Fast forward 20 years, and the pecking order of the school leaderboard has changed around. Now David is a nationally syndicated journalist who is very influential and read by all the right people, many of whom naturally belong to the special group. Sam is a powerful lawyer who is often called upon to help draft laws by those in power. Ben is now a leading human rights lawyer engaged in driving an agenda for change at a national level. Jim and John end up becoming working lawyers but for average firms. Joe becomes the editor of a local newspaper. Graham, meanwhile, can't make it in journalism and went on to teach English at school level. Now, let us imagine that these results among people who belong to the special group are replicated at a national level, whereby something like 3% of the population becomes the top 3% of the population. Has this happened because A these people are more talented and more intelligent, or B, because these people have superior in-group preference. Is this A, simply the marketplace at work, or is it B, because these people have superior in-group preference? Now consider that in addition to these differences in outcome, Ben, Sam and David leverage their positions to further the power of their special group. David uses his national platform to advocate for laws that will be of benefit to the special group. Ben and Sam use their respective positions to implement said laws. In fact, the extensive network of those people in the special group coordinate between politics, law, academia and the media to ensure that those changes are in fact made. They also leverage their power to ensure that anyone in the out group who make up 97% of the population, people such as Jim, John, Joe or Graham, would be professionally hurt and even censored from opposing such laws. Now, although deep down they disagree with these changes, Jim, John, Joe and Graham find it difficult to mount any sort of counter-offensive. First and foremost, each of them believes that they are individuals living in a society of individuals. They believe that they have achieved their positions through merit and they don't want to hurt those careers they've worked so hard to achieve. In any case, there's no such thing as a group. So what is it that binds Jim, John, Joe and Graham? Absolutely nothing. Within their own framework, there is nothing that they can say binds them at all. It strikes me that in any scenario in which there is an ostensibly free market, but in which money can be levied, whether through the media, academia, legal channels, or directly through politics to influence government decisions, this situation will always massively favour a tightly organised special group at the expense of everyone else, both in theory and in practice. 
In fact, one might argue that this sort of situation produces an incentive for the special group slowly to transition the system from being a nominally free market to being more socialist and command and control in orientation by formalizing their superiority using inequitable rules, which is to say by making themselves an actual ruling caste as opposed to people who, on the face of it, do well, albeit using an informal power network. Thus, the nominally free market state can be used as a kind of Trojan horse to transition into a more socialist state, especially if the political system relies on persuading large groups of people using the media, as democracy of course does. Now, this might appear to be little more than egalitarian whining on behalf of the majority group. For example, why shouldn't the special group rule if they play the game better than anyone else? A fair question. Until we recognise, that is, that the special group's vested interests are very damaging to the majority group and to the nation as a whole. This presents a significant problem because it is practically impossible for the majority to organise in the same tight-knit and coordinated way as the special group can. Egalitarianism actually works as a hindrance here and the special group group can prey on lingering internal class resentments to his advantage, thereby masking its own supremacy. The myths of individualism and meritocracy work to their advantage because it allows the aforementioned informal network to flourish until such a time comes as they may formally enshrine their power in law. Therefore, it is in the majority group's interest to recognise their own special group. Let's call it the upper class, or you can call it the ruling class, who might realistically compete with the currently dominant special group. This requires those in the lower classes of the majority to accept that there will be certain built-in inequities let's say, hereditary land ownership or opportunities that are available only for those in the ruling class, and also to divest themselves of liberal notions such as individualism, fairness or meritocracy. Only with a vested and powerful minority ruling class could the majority hope to oust the special group, which could only be done by building a rival network and practicing the same ruthless in-group preference and lawfare, including passing laws that are inherently unfair, as the special group does. As ever, let me know your thoughts in the comments and please, for the purposes of this video, do not try to assign particular people or groups to the examples I have outlined here. I will delete any comments that do that. Keep the conversation unspecific and theoretical, and I think we'll have a better discussion. Thank you. Friends, Romans, countrymen, shh, come this way. Lend me your ears. Secrets of ancient rhetoric can now be yours for a trifling sum. The art of persuasive argument is all around us. In fact, we are surrounded by it. We live in a rhetorical age, but this is seldom taught and even more seldom explained. It is not for you to know, they said. The master of grammar knows how to write with clarity, precision and correctness. The master of logic knows how to disarm his opponents with reason alone and both can be powerful adversaries. But the master of rhetoric can outflank both, caring as he does little for their rules and even less for their defeated tears. The master of grammar asks, is this sentence correct? Is this sentence clear? The master of rhetoric wonders, does my speech have the power to sway the passions? Can my words move the crowd. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. The master of logic trains his mind to eliminate fallacies 
and formulate correct and well-defined arguments. The master of rhetoric knows that the reasoning mind can be flooded with emotions, that the flood can short-circuit logic and overwhelm his opponent who will crumple. They will wonder why their well-written, well-reasoned arguments were so defenseless against the rhetor's apparent ability to bend reality to his will. Do the faces in the crowd not see through this dark magic? The master of rhetoric laughed at their wonder. He looked at the bemused, despairing face of the master of logic and spoke. Harness that wonder, my friend. It was your own beloved Socrates who said, the only true wisdom is in knowing that you know nothing. And wonder is the beginning of wisdom. He turned to the master of grammar. So lucid and correct your prose, but why does nobody listen to you? It was your own favourite, George Orwell, who wrote, Perhaps a lunatic was simply a majority of one. Do not rail at the crowd for what is in their nature. Understand what they are, and they will listen to you. And with that, the master of rhetoric was gone. Find out what else he has to say by signing up to Foundations of Rhetoric. Fulfill your destiny and complete the trivium. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out. Well, hello everyone. Trying something a little bit different here. I don't have my um, equipment, my laptop with me. That's all at AA Lodge. It's also the middle of the night, so I need to speak quietly. I need to make like the thief and adder be reasonably silent. But, uh, you know, I thought um, I would share some thoughts. I'll just uh, sit down here. I thought I would share some thoughts uh, with the equipment that I have. And um, I recently uh, made a Telegram post based on a number of tweets that I did, um, summing up some of my recent thinking about power. A lot of it comes from uh, working on this course, Foundations of Politics, uh, that I've been um, doing recently. Uh, the other thing I did is that uh, I'm going to be appearing on Millennial uh, on the 20th, and I had to send Millennial Woes some notes about what I might want to talk about now. Knowing streams as I do, it's probable that we won't get through even a quarter of what I sent him. But I thought it might be interesting for me to just share um, what I did send him, just for some food for thought. Maybe you can see this as my... Uh, Christmas address, as it were. Anyway, so I'm sick of the old channel. I hope you like that little uh, chopping board there from uh, Triple H. She loves that. Anyway, let us, let's make a start then, shall we? So, this is what I wrote on Telegram, first of all. As is often the case, I've spent a while answering queries on Twitter from men who struggle to see the world as it is rather than how they think it ought to be. I'll paste some highlights below since it forms a kind of essay. I hate to break it to libertarians, but the use of force is not only necessary, but at times actively desirable. If merchants and priests are, are not sporadically disciplined and brought to heel by power, we end up with what we have now, oligarchy without accountability, puppet kings. There is no outside of this. The best that can happen is a temporary smashing of teeth so that they take 100 years to grow back. And in the process, new teeth in other places will grow. No solutions 
only trade-offs and currently any trade-off is better than none quite a juvenilian uh, emphasis to my analysis there power's will is to centralize it's like the bits of t1000 always trying to get back together then it seeks to terminate rivals the minds of men are converted to the logic of power once they are in power they will then eliminate rival castles this not only happens globally or nationally but even on a small scale power says everywhere and always there can be only one this applies to all systems no matter what they call themselves and it is not one man but a power center which could comprise millions of people our current power center is vast and likely the biggest of all time you might wish to ignore it but it will not ignore you notions such as federalism or devolved or dispersed power under a loose affiliation are hopelessly utopian since no matter what laws are put in place sovereign is he who makes the exception and the top layer of power will seek oversight of the treasury or whatever else you decide to put beyond its purview separation of powers is almost always a delusion and a myth there is no separating politics from law that's Carl Schmidt's lesson there is no separating politics from the economy that's Juvenal's lesson there is no separating politics from society that is the lesson of Mosca and Pareto and to some extent Michelle's as well if you think the current system is decentralized in any way try setting up an institution that is a direct rival to its power and watch in all with the speed and ruthlessness with which its agents will seek to destroy it imagine all the hundreds of agent smiths who will kick into action are they decentralized I have few illusions or hopes for any new regime, none whatsoever. I simply want our current rulers overthrown. And the best that could be hoped for is to realign who counts as an enemy, an enemy to power, that is. I prefer that it wasn't me. Much better for the enemy to be the spiteful mutants. Okay, so that, that was the end of the Telegram post. And uh, I'll just take a, another sip of tea here. Mm. Mm. A lovely brew. If you're wondering what the tea is, it's um, Towler's, actually. I've had it for ages. But, um, yeah, slowly but surely getting through my Towler's. Anyway, so let's have a look. What I sent woes. I've got to get it up a second on my iPad here. Okay, so th th this is much more elliptical. There's there's no script here. It's just a list of bullet points that I sent to woes um, of things that we might possibly discuss. All right, get ready for this. Boomer truth regime. Ultimate good is individual self-expression. Ultimate evil is Nazis. Best system is liberal democracy. Only metric is material well-being. All aspects of the boomer truth regime are a lie. One of the worst lies is the accidental view of history, or the bottom-up view, or the anarchistic view, which must be banished from the mind of any right-winger. Politics and culture are fundamentally top-down, and culture is downstream of power, as per Mosca, Pareto, Michels, Schmidt, Juvenal, Burnham, Francis, Gottfried. Democracy is not only a sham, and it is ruled by merchants and media. It is the right to be propagandized by rich men. And if you haven't caught it, go and watch uh, the stream that I did with Semiagog and not the BBC the other day, the cigar stream on Bernays. For more on that, most corporate entities aren't even controlled by identifiable rich men anymore, but by managers acting on behalf of faceless institutional investors such as 
Black Rock and Vanguard. This makes our current system one of the most opaque in all history, since no one knows who is in charge, even though everyone knows it isn't Joe Biden or Boris Johnson. There is no alternative but complete regime overthrow, collapse or the victory of a foreign power. Energy in party politics is a waste of time. Energy converting normies is now a waste of time. What is required is an iron and watertight vanguard of fanatics who can work with tight organisation. The system is extremely good at putting down uh, organisation. It's drawn to organisation like the eye of Sauron. Therefore, rather than one tight organisation, it needs to be around 150 or 200 such organisations who are loosely affiliated but working at a local level. The system will be overwhelmed if they all move at once. The eye of Sauron can't look 200 ways at once. And of course, we are nowhere near being ready for that. I think that individual issues, immigration, COVID and so on, are all distractions from the top issue, the number one issue of regime overthrow. The system is expert at distraction and at dissipating your energy. Here is a list of things that need to die. Belief in democracy, belief in rule of law or the constitution, belief in equality under the rule of law, belief in liberalism, libertarianism in general, the idea that any individual currently in the system has your interests at heart or that they could be a hero. Cartoon cowboy individualism of the Anne Rand variety, arguing over stats, arguing over economics, belief in mathematical modelling, belief in entryism or reverse grantryism. You can't work in a system that wants to move left. It's in its central logic, because that is what democracy is. You cannot work, quote, within the system. And finally, signalling that Nazis are the benchmark evil. All of these things need to die. All right, let me know what you think, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is a bit kind of experimental video for me. Maybe it will come out, maybe it won't. While I'm here, um, thank you everybody for watching me and supporting this channel all year. If you're a channel member or if you've bought a course or uh, if you uh, sent super chats or even if you're just a lowly truck who hangs out in the chat, um, thank you very much for sticking around. Hopefully much more to come next year. Have a good Christmas, everyone. Now get out. How do I do it? Hold on a minute. This is going to be tricky. For fuck's sake. Right, get out, everyone.